Good morning, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for saying good morning back. <laughs> so welcome to the 2023 Health Disparities Roundtable, and thank you for taking the time to be here. Those of you who are here in person and those of you who are here online, good morning. <laughs> so uh, I'm Dr. Lynn Eberly. I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs here in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota, and I'm honored to be here today. This roundtable is one of the most enduring events put on by the School of Public Health uh, for the public health community and for public health in general, public in general, coming on close to two decades now. The Health Equity Workgroup was founded in the spring of 2005 with the mission of conducting, promoting, and providing greater visibility to health equity research, strengthening collaborative efforts, creating lasting partnerships with community-based organizations, and ensuring School of Public Health students and faculty to work effectively in a diverse society. The Health Disparities Roundtable aims to amplify equity work by inviting solutions-based organizations to address pressing issues in public health. It is my pleasure to open this roundtable, which has the timely topic of advancing mental health equity. It is a topic so important to address when advocating for health equity, especially among intersectional identities. I see this directly in my work as a trained mental health advocate for students here at the university. We are here today to identify and discuss effective and sustainable policies, practices, and programs to achieve mental health equity. We can do this by recognizing the social determinants of mental health inequity and barriers to care that marginalized communities face such as racial, ethnic, low income, LGBTQ+, and rural communities. We must also identify strategies and policies needed to increase access to mental health services in order to advance mental health equity. Barriers to well-being and mental health care disproportionately affect communities of color, indigenous communities, members of the LGBTQ community, and those living in poverty. We still seek to better understand the effects of mental health disparities locally, nationally, and globally, while also highlighting sustainable interventions, policies, and strategies to counter those root causes of mental health inequities. The School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota peoples. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for this region, Minnesota Makoche which loosely translates to the land where the waters reflect the skies. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen relations with our tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. Lastly, I want to thank everyone who has made this roundtable possible this year. This includes the School of Public Health Health Equity Workgroup, the Center for Leadership Education in Maternal and Child Public Health, the Dean's Office, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Division of Environmental Health, and the Center for Anti-Racism Research for Health Equity. In addition, the University of Minnesota Medical School Program and Health Disparities Research is also a partner in today's roundtable. Finally, thank you to the roundtable committee members themselves for their hard work in planning today's event, and I'm looking forward to it. Now, I'm pleased to turn the podium over to today's moderator, Dr. Marla Eisenberg, who is professor in pediatrics in the Division of General Pediatrics and Adolescent Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Lynn. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm looking forward to this panel, and it's an honor to be able to introduce our distinguished lineup of speakers. Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Gilbert Gonzalez, 
His presentation will be called Mental Health Policy, Lessons Learned from LGBTQ Plus Policy to Achieve Health Equity. Dr. Gonzalez is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, Health and Society, the Department of Health Policy, and the Program for Public Policy Studies at Vanderbilt University. Professor Gonzalez's research examines how public policies affect health outcomes, access to care, and health disparities for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer and questioning populations. He also studies the role of healthcare reforms and on vulnerable populations. Our second speaker today will be Sue Abder Holden. She'll be speaking on disparities in mental health, working towards health equity. Ms. Abder Holden has served as the executive director for NAMI Minnesota, that's the National Alliance on Mental Illness, since 2001. She's held leadership positions with ARC of Minnesota, with the Senator Paul Wellstone Center and Pacer Center. She has a BA in political science from McAllister College and a master's degree in public health administration from the University of Minnesota. She's also a community faculty member for our School of Social Work, where she teaches health and mental health policy. Ms. Abder Holden has received numerous awards for her advocacy, including the 2020 Esther Wattenberg Policy Award and being named one of the 100 most influential healthcare leaders by Minnesota Physician. Our third presenter today will be Dr. Anthony Stately, um, speaking on an ongoing syndemic, the impact of public health crisis in Minnesota's first peoples. Dr. Stately received his PhD in clinical psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology at Alliant International University in 1997. He currently is the executive officer and president for the Native American Community Clinic in South Minneapolis, which provides primary care, dental care, and behavioral health services for the Twin Cities Native American community. He formerly worked as the director of behavioral health programs at the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community in Prior Lake, Minnesota, and previously he was a research scientist and director of the Center for Translational Research at the, at the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the University of Washington in Seattle, and director of client services at AIDS Project in Los Angeles, and the founding and inaugural program director for Seven Generations Child and Family Counseling Services in Los Angeles. Our fourth speaker today will be Jeremy Hansen Willis, and he'll be speaking on queering community health. Mr. Hansen Willis was appointed Chief Executive Officer for Rainbow Health in April 2019 to unite a merged organization working for health equity with those facing multiple barriers to health as racial, sexual, and or gender minorities. Rainbow Health centers LGBTQ plus people, black, indigenous, and communities of color, and other communities affected by HIV and other diseases of injustice. Under Jeremy's leadership, Rainbow Health has nearly tripled its annual budget with expanded mental and chemical health services, a free teleprep and STI clinic, and aging programs for older LGBTQ plus adults and people with HIV. It's my pleasure now to turn our morning over to Dr. Gonzalez to kick off our, spe our speakers. Please join us. Thank you, Dr. Eisenberg, for that introduction. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here back at the University of Minnesota. I completed my uh, PhD in health policy here in 2015 and spent the last eight years uh, at Vanderbilt University um, researching LGBTQ health and how public policy impacts LGBTQ health outcomes and, uh, and, and access to care. Um, just before I get started, I want to put a plug in for the uh, Vanderbilt LGBTQ plus policy lab. If there are uh, future PhD students or postdocs in the audience, whether in person or on Zoom, um, please consider applying to our program for uh, to, to study uh, in PhDs in, uh, in health policy, so sociology, and LGBTQ health. Um, but we also um, hire, we're also hiring two postdocs every year to join us uh, for two years to uh, study LGBTQ health and policy issues. So just a little bit of uh, just a little bit of uh, background on me. Most of my research uh, uses secondary data to study LGBTQ health and access to care. Um, I've used probably an, every data source from the CDC or the U.S. Census Bureau to document LGBTQ health disparities, including mental health. Um, and um, I'll just give you some examples. Um, this is uh, these are data from. 
uh, the National Health Interview Survey, and the study was published in JAMA Internal Medicine um, in 2016. And what you can see is that th these are measures of mental health and, and uh, substance use uh, for LGBT. LGB uh, populations and uh, adults in the uh, CDC's National Health Interview Survey. And what you can see is that there are elevated mental health and behavioral health needs among LGB uh, populations. Um, about 40%, 46% of bisexual adults age 18 years and older um, are reporting uh, uh, symptoms of psychological distress. Um, and this is based on, uh, you know, in the past 30 days, how often do they feel sad, blue, tired, everything took a lot of effort and energy. Um, there's also uh, higher levels of alcohol use and heavy drinking and uh, current uh, cigarette use and tobacco use altogether uh, for uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual adults compared to heterosexual counterparts. Unfortunately, it's, it, we haven't had good uh, uh, health information on transgender populations until um, very, very recently. Um, but this is just some sexual orientation-based uh, disparities. And oftentimes people ask, why? What's going on with sexual and gender minorities or SGM populations? Um, and so um, in, in the LGBTQ health literature, we often point uh, to minority stress theory as the prevailing uh, understanding on why LGBTQ health disparities exist. Uh, minority stress pos postulates that uh, discriminatory environments and public policies can stigmatize LGBTQ people and can uh, facilitate feelings of rejection, shame, and low self-esteem, which can neg negatively shape their health and health-related uh, behaviors, either as coping mechanisms or as responses from uh, direct violence, uh, interpersonal, and structural discrimination. Um, and unfortunately, this happens across the entire life course. Um, young, uh, LGBTQ youth are oftentimes and still bullied in, in schools. Uh, when, uh, during adulthood, um, LGBTQ people may not receive jobs with excellent healthcare benefits. Uh, they may be fired for their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And even in later life, oftentimes LGBTQ people have to go back into the closet when entering long-term care, long-term services and supports. So this happens across the entire uh, life course. Um, this next uh, section I wanna focus on is on how public policy uh, can create barriers to health care, including mental health care, and, uh, and, and, and even facilitate anxiety and depression for minoritized populations. And so these are just a few headlines. And I, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, where Vanderbilt's located. And these are a few um, uh, headlines from the Tennessean, which is our, our, our big statewide uh, newspaper. Um, you can see a few headlines here. Tennessee legislature passes ban on gender transition health care for minors. Um, uh, and so uh, starting uh, in July, uh, gender minority youth, transgender youth, uh, will no longer have access to gender affirming care. Um, and, and including things like puberty blockers. And this, this, this sets up a, a, a hurdle for parents of trans youth who are really terrified of these, uh, these types of policies. Um, Senate bill passes, uh, a Senate passes bill giving religious protection to therapists. This is a law that's been uh, uh, held in the state, upheld in the state for the last three or four years. This means that mental health care providers and counselors can deny patients uh, based off of their religion or, or closely held beliefs. So someone can deny, a counselor could deny an LGBTQ person just because they don't, their, their religion or their beliefs just don't align with uh, sexual and gender diversity. You know, frankly, if you are an LGBTQ affirming mental health care provider, you should probably not be uh, serving LGBTQ clients. Um, what I worry about is that we already face a mental health care professional shortage in the United States, especially in rural America. And I worry about the, uh, the LGBTQ uh, adults and young people who may need emergency mental health services, uh, continuous mental, he uh, mental health therapy and counseling and uh, this, is, this is a real barrier to mental health care for LGBTQ uh, populations. Um, public policy can also promote fear and anxiety among minoritized uh, families and individuals. So you can see a few more headlines here from Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee bills would allow adoption agencies to deny LGBT couples on religious grounds. 
A Tennessee House passes bill letting clerks refuse marriage licenses to LGBTQ couples. Um, a bill that will likely get through. Um, and Tennessee becomes the first state in, the, in 2023 to restrict drag performances. And so this was recently signed into law uh, where, uh, where drag, uh, drag queens cannot perform in public, on public spaces, or in front of children, including libraries and schools. Um, and, and I worry that this type of legislation signals to LGBTQ families and individuals that you're not welcome here in, 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 in certain spaces in the state of Tennessee. And that really does trigger um, fear and, and anxiety among minoritized uh, populations. Um, and so, I, you know, inciting fear across communities, across minoritized communities, is part of the strategy and is strategic, whether it's intentional or not. And in recent years, um, I worry that public policy um, has incited fear across multiple marginalized identities, whether it's uh, BIPOC populations, uh, women um, who may, and, and people who may be seeking abortions um, and anti-LGBTQ uh, legislation. So these are just a few things, and these are all intersecting uh, issues as well. So uh, for instance, uh, banning books on, on race, ethnicity, slavery, and LGBTQ issues in K through 12 curriculum. There's certainly um, some uh, intersecting uh, issues here. Immigration reform and policy has, uh, in some places, you know, when, when uh, governors are flying uh, immigrants across the country to sanctuary cities, this incites fear and anxiety among immigrant communities in, the, in those places. Um, issues like uh, voter suppression um, and making it more difficult to, to vote and to engage in civil life um, has also uh, risen in recent years. And, and, um, and, and I think, unfortunately, this is intentional from those who are in power. They want to scare and scatter minoritized communities so that way we we return to our silos and our safe places and regroup separately and not together collectively. And I think that's what we really need uh, in the United States is, is collective action to, to achieve mental health equity. Uh, minoritized groups uh, need to work together to ensure that all, all people have access to mental health, health care, and, and feel safe and welcome in their spaces. Um, and, and frankly, this is not, this is not an attack on, on white populations, um, and I, I, hope, I hope it's not uh, reflected that way, because, you know, uh, after all, I, I firmly believe that we do share overlapping and intersectional identities across our, our diverse uh, communities. You know, if you're sitting in the audience, you, you may be like me, a great grandson of an immigrant or even the first generation student of a, uh, of a truck driver. And those are issues that we can all uh, identify with and, and, and make connections with each other. And so I do want to, so I do want to brainstorm and just do some thought experiments on what public policy solutions can look like for improving and achieving mental health equity broadly. And these are uh, just two very academic, nerdy, high-level thoughts on, uh, on how to minimize harm and advance health equity from a public health and health policy perspective. And so, you know, when, when we think about state policy and politics. Um, and a lot of legislation happens at the state level, including healthcare legislation. Um, we often uh, describe uh, our states as laboratories of democracy. And this came out of a, a Supreme Court case uh, from uh, uh, Justice Lu uh, Louis Brandeis, uh, where he wrote about these laboratories of democracy. A single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. And this is a fantastic idea. This is how uh, we created Medicaid uh, one state at a time. This is how we created SNAP one state at a time and unemployment benefits one state at a time uh, and, and, and informed public policy for the nation. But if we think about these laboratories of democracy, what happens when these experiments cause mental and emotional harm to populations. And I think public health is, 
is the perfect discipline to inform these issues. And I want to point to the Belmont Report, um, which came out of uh, in, in the late 1970s. And this uh, was uh, uh, a report from the National Comm Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. And if anybody here has ever submitted anything to the IRB or done IRB training, you are probably familiar with the Belmont Report. This provides the guiding principles for ethical research, um, and it includes uh, and summarizes three ethical principles of research, respect of persons, beneficence, and justice. And if we think about this analogy as states, as laboratories, these should be our guiding principles for these experiments so that we ensure that we're not causing emotional and, uh, and, and, uh, and mental harm on populations when states are, are, um, are, 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 are experimenting in their labs. So it's just one idea, and the panelists who will be following <laughs> afterwards will be giving more detailed uh, recommendations on what, on what those policies uh, could, could look like. Um, and lastly, I just want to wrap up with thinking about, so I want, we should be thinking about how to minimize harm, but also promote mental health and mental health equity. So how can we do that? I, I think um, we can think about public policy as a prescription for better population health. You know, when individuals go into clinics, there are many times, many of us have been prescribed medications by a provider, but what if we use that same analogy for the population? And so what is the accurate prescription? And I'll give you one example. In 2014, I uh, wrote a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, a perspective on same-sex marriage and marriage equality. And I recommended that marriage equality uh, be a prescription for health, for better health for LGBTQ communities. And when you read this, and I reflect on this almost 10 years later, um, it, it, it sounds like that you know this was a, just a one-time uh, need and it would and, and LGBTQ health disparities would go away because now we have marriage equality. And I was, and I was wrong. I was wrong. And, you know, and, and, and LGBTQ health disparities uh, just have not gone away. Marriage equality has improved health insurance coverage and access to care for LGBTQ populations. But we still have rampant and wide LGBTQ health disparities in mental health and physical health. And, and, and I, I, I think I, I, I was wrong with this, uh, with this idea. But now, you know, t almost 10 years later, I'm thinking about how do we use policy as a prescription for LGBTQ population health? Maybe it's time to increase the dosage. And what does that look like? Um, and so not only do we need marriage equality, but we also need to... Uh, to uh, ensure that bans against LGBT hate crimes are enforced, that we have data on, on, on LGBTQ hate crimes, but we also need non-discrimination protections throughout the social determinants of health. So that way LGBTQ people, they feel safe in schools when they are shopping for houses and when they are applying for loans from banks uh, uh, in public spaces, uh, whether it's on planes or trains, LGBTQ people um, need uh, to have uh, protections from discrimination throughout the social determinants of health. And I think that will help us advance towards LGBTQ mental health equity. Um, and that's, that's all I, that I have today. I thank you all for, for having me, ha having invited me today. And I'll be around throughout the day. And if you have questions, I'm happy to uh, meet with you. Um, if, if, uh, if we don't have a chance to meet, feel free to email me um, at gilbert.gonzalez at vanderbilt.edu. And looking forward to this morning's discussions. Thank you. Well, good morning and thanks so much for inviting me here. I'm going to talk a little bit about disparities in mental health and how we can actually start working towards equity. So we all know there's disparities. I don't think I have to go into great detail there, right? And I think some of the worrisome things, especially coming out of the pandemic, is that we're actually seeing some of the rates of suicide um, rising faster among BIPOC communities. 
lots of reasons for that, um, in, especially in terms of how the pandemic uh, hurt BIPOC communities. We had more people um, catch uh, COVID, be hospitalized for COVID and die from COVID. And so there were a lot of deaths in the community. You add on George Floyd's murder and all of that. There, it, there's, you know, it was a really difficult time. Um, we're also seeing drug overdoses um, disproportionately affecting people from BIPOC communities. Um, interesting, the overall rates of mental illnesses and substance use disorders are actually lower, but we actually think that's because they're probably undiagnosed because you can't actually find a provider from your community. Um, we also know that um, people face disproportionate barriers um, to accessing mental health care. Um, so this is just some data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and it just shows generally a lot of people don't access mental health care, right? We just have a very low acceptance rate there. But then when we look at the BIPOC communities, one of the data points was 53% of people who are black did not receive treatment for severe anxiety and depression compared to 36% of people who are white. So people are not accessing care in the same way. And we know there's lots of reasons for this. One, we don't actually have a lot of culturally sensitive screening tools. PHQ-9, which is the normal one that's used, is not necessarily sensitive to different cultures. And so maybe we aren't catching things um, that we might have otherwise. We have a severe shortage of culturally specific providers. Um, and I'm gonna focus more on that in a little bit. We also know that um, people from BIPOC communities tend to have larger rates of being uninsured or being underinsured. So maybe their um, deductibles are at 5,000 or $6,000, which makes it actually very difficult to access um, care. Uh, reliable transportation. I don't, we mapped out once what it would take for a parent in North Minneapolis to get their child from school and get them to a children's therapist and how many bus trips and, and changes and you know all of that would be and it was ridiculous, it would take hours. Um, we also know that racism plays a huge role. We know that a lot of um, black men are actually misdiagnosed with schizophrenia, kind of misinterpreting some of those um, symptoms that they're seeing. And then there's just, we don't wanna talk about it in our community. We don't necessarily have a word in our language for mental illness. Um, we don't wanna be called crazy, and so we're just not gonna talk about it in our community, which also then creates a barrier to accessing care. And I think what we've seen, particularly in the juvenile justice system, is that often for a young person or even adult, their first contact with a mental health professional is through the criminal justice system, which also doesn't bode well in terms of early intervention and actually being able uh, and willing to accept that care. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the kind of the provider issue, because if you can't find a provider that really understands you, you probably aren't gonna go back. And what we really wanna do is to ensure um, good care. So you can see in Minnesota, 88% um, of our therapists are white. That is really ridiculous, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and you know, it's actually a tiny bit better with psychiatrists, which is unusual, frankly. But you can just see we just don't have enough people from diverse communities at all. And this is just Minnesota data. We also looked at, well, what are the age, um, and they, they just do female and male um, in their studies. And so we can see the median age is 43, and for psychiatrists, it's 51. And that we have, actually have to really think about, because if they're 51, when are they gonna retire, and do we have enough people coming in behind them? Um, we also see that most of the mental health therapists um, are actually women. And so then that could actually be difficult uh, for men who may not want to talk to a woman about the issues or feel that they can't understand um, what they're going through. And, you know, I think um, I see a lot of women in the audience. A lot of us w won't go to a man who's an OBGYN, right? We want to see someone of, you know, our, a kind of our, our same sex to be able to talk more freely and, and feel like they un actually understand what we're going through. We did look at to see, um, so is it gonna be better? Are there younger people coming in? And it does look a little bit better. There's a little bit more diversity among our younger uh, mental health professionals, um, which is good, but we still obviously have a long way to go. And so what are the barriers to actually creating a diverse workforce? Well, we have to kind of back way up, right? So if we have disparities in graduating from high school, we're not gonna get people through with college and through the master's programs. The cost of college education is going up, uh, which is a huge barrier to many people. Um, if you wanna be a clinical social worker, you often have to work for free um, during your internship and practicum, and not everybody can afford to do that. 
Finding and paying for someone to provide your supervision is also a huge barrier. We know in Minnesota that there are literally over 3,000 people who graduated from a master's program and didn't go on to become licensed. And so we really have to look at those barriers. Um, we've also found, and the National Association of Social Work actually looked at that, that the tests aren't culturally informed and we see great disparities in who passes the test. And I don't think it's because people aren't good, I think it's because the tests are screwed up and they aren't really culturally informed um, to be able to say, yes, this person is gonna be a good clinician. Um, and then finding someone from your own race, right, culture, LGBTQ status, um, to be your supervisor so they can really help you through this is also very difficult. And then low pay. Um, when we look at what mental health professionals are paid versus other types of healthcare professionals, it's very low. And in, uh, here's one of the charts, and as you can see, um, frankly, dental hygienists often make more than some of our clinicians. And nothing against dental hyg you know, hygienists, I want them to be nice when I get my teeth clean. Um, but, but again, that there's a lot of work and you know, education that goes into being a mental health professional. So what can we do? So we're not in Tennessee, um, and we've actually made some good progress in Minnesota, um, starting back actually in 2013, where we passed legislation to say, we need to look at our mental health workforce. We need to look at how do we get more people into the field? How do we uh, make sure that they're learning the right things in their education? And how do we create a more diverse workforce? Um, so actually in 20, um, 21 and 22, we made some huge gains, I think. The first thing is we actually are requiring all mental health professionals to get at least four CEUs on culture. Understanding culture, what are the differences between cultures, what about social diversity and uh, oppression, cultural humility, and that's a first. There were no required CEUs before. And I wanna tell you, it was not easy actually to get it passed. Our bill actually had six CEUs and we landed on four as a compromise. We also created a culturally informed and responsive mental health task force, um, which started meeting last fall. And we really wanna look more, what are those barriers that are preventing people from becoming licensed, right? What are those barriers to even getting into the field? Um, what can we do in terms of our practices, treatment practices to also make it um, better for folks? We made sure that the loan forgiveness program for healthcare professionals now includes not only LADCs, but all mental health professionals. And we've seen that actually we have a lot of people who apply um, to actually you know, help with their loans. We also, you know, we really heard that people couldn't find a supervisor from their culture. So um, one of the bills that we passed actually will pay for classes for BIPOC mental health professionals to become supervisors. Um, so we're gonna make it really easy for them. It was passed in 2021. We've already seen 215 mental health professionals become supervisors, which we just got that data a few weeks ago and I was thrilled because I think that's a huge number. And what they think is that at least 400 students then will be able to find someone from their um, race or culture. And it was a very diverse group. So I thought that was a great way to go. And we also included underrepresented, which includes groups not um, represented in the majority in terms of race, <clears throat> race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, or physical um, ability. So it's a really broad group. We also wanted to make sure, and sorry, I forgot to delete a few words there, but um, we wanted to make sure that if you're doing your internship or practicum, that you get paid. And the way to do that is to say, you will automatically be a mental health practitioner. And so that way it makes it easier for an organization to hire you because they can bill for you, but then they can also pay for you. We also required all of our licensing boards to be diverse. We wanted to make sure that who's at the table making decisions about whether it's social work, LMFT, whatever it is, that you have a diverse group, including rural Minnesota, um, because issues are different there in terms of finding someone to supervise you. We passed SIPACT, um, which is kind of a national way to say if, you're, if your state joins SIPACT, then your psychologist can work in another SIPACT state. And so because Minnesota has now joined it, we can actually have um, uh, a psychologist from other states practice here as well. We're allowing mental health practitioners to be case managers. Frankly, they often know a whole lot more about our mental health system. And, and we also heard from a lot of providers that, they're, um, that they had a lot of BIPOC mental health pr practitioners who wanted to become case managers but couldn't. So this opened that door up as well. We also wanted to say, how can we make supervision be for free? 
And what we heard from a lot of clinics, especially if they took a lot of Medicaid patients, is, you know, we don't get much money. We can't really afford to do this. Um, private clinics could. And so we said, okay, we're going to target the money um, to organizations that have higher Medicaid um, so that they can actually attract people because then they can provide supervision for free. And so those dollars will be going out the door very soon. The other things we looked at is what about a brief diagnostic assessment? You know, when a family from different cultures are coming in, you don't want to hit them up with all those questions the first or second visit. And so now you can actually get 10 sessions before you do the full-blown DA, which we think actually will open up access to care um, to more people. Many years ago, 2007, we actually started the Schooling to Mental Health program. And I think this is another way to address barriers to care. And the way that it works is actually funding grant money goes to um, mental health organizations who then co-locate in the school. So they can bill private and public insurance. Um, there's a firewall between the education um, and the healthcare records, which is important to families. But we get rid of the barriers to care. You don't have to worry about transportation. The therapist sees the child in their own milieu. And we've actually seen that's addressed a lot of the disparities, particularly in our, um, in our cities. We also created a shelter-linked program. So we not, you know a lot of youth in the shelters are actually LGBTQ. They're not accessing mental health care. They don't know how to navigate the system. So we did the same thing. The money goes to a mental health organization who co-locates at the shelter, really increasing access to care. Uh, Minnesota is on the road to banning conversion therapy, which is really obviously a good thing. Also protecting gender-affirming care. Uh, another thing is continuous eligibility for Medicaid. Now that the public health emergency is over, we are very worried about lots of people falling off. And a, and a big uh, push is to make sure that all children up to the age of six will have continuous eligibility. And I think that's really important for child development, both in terms of mental health um, and health care. Peer specialists is another way to really broaden access to health care. Um, and so those are people with lived experience who are doing well in their recovery. And there's something about if you have a serious mental illness and you're talking to someone who's been there, done that, you might be more engaged in your care, right, and be able to kind of accept treatment as well. So we think that's an important part. And then our mobile mental health crisis teams, which in Minnesota, every single county and many of the tribes have a mobile mental health crisis team so that you don't have to have a police response to a mental health um, uh, issue. And so we think that also is a way to really expand care as well. The CMIG grants are a huge thing in Minnesota. And so what they're supposed to do is really um, go to agencies to provide culturally specific trauma-informed services, um, do outreach um, and early intervention, increase the number of providers by doing things like providing supervision, and really build their infrastructure as well. The grants have been through the federal block grant, about 600,000 a year. Um, our bill this year, we put $10 million um, into these grants, and you can see the focus in terms of the communities. And so again, by really supporting those small, usually smaller um, you know, BIPOC mental health agencies, they're gonna be able to grow um, and become stronger as well, and hopefully we'll get even more of them developing across the state of Minnesota. Um, we also will put in um, to the state grants funding cultural healers. We've done more work with elders um, uh, from indigenous communities, but shamans, for example, they're not a part of this. And so we want to make sure that those culturally specific organizations can actually bring folks in. We also found that um, in residential services, uh, both kids and adults, they have no way to fund interpreters. Well, then how do people access care? And so this would actually fund interpreters. We also know that community health workers do a wonderful job connecting to their communities and explaining healthcare services. So we want to create a certificate program for them on mental health so that then they can go into their communities and really make sure people understand what mental health treatment is and provide feedback actually to the providers as well. We also want to fund culturally specific provider consultation. So maybe there's a therapist in southern Minnesota who um, has a, a, a Somali woman in, in her office, not sure, right, how to really engage her. We could pay a Somali social worker to work with that particular social worker to make sure that we're providing better care for someone. And then we just know we have to increase our rates for mental health care. If we really want to expand it and get more people into the field, we just need to do that. Um, many of you hopefully have heard about 988, um, and we need to fund that in Minnesota to make sure right now we're doing about 80% of the calls in Minnesota, but we're not doing very many tax lines. And so we need that funding to actually expand that. And we have seen the calls and texts go up to 988. 
And again, this is a way to have a mental health response to a mental health crisis so that we are not involving police. And I think that that's really important um, as a part of this. Um, we also created a third path residential for children. So if a kid needs to go into residential treatment, unfortunately right now, basically you're going through the child protection system, which frankly can be very dangerous for BIPOC families. This third path just means we have this set of money here to pay for room and board, which is why we go through child protection, right? Because 4E pays for room and board. So these state funds would pay for room and board so you don't have to go through that door. You don't have to risk um, someone misinterpreting what's going on in your family. Uh, we want to increase money for school linked, um, shelter linked, and actually community college linked. We want to establish a mental health substance use disorder education center, which what they have in, in Nebraska, and they were able to increase their workforce by 38%. So you've got a small group of people really focused on our workforce, really looking at who's coming into the colleges, right? Who's getting licensed? What are those barriers? And coming back with um, recommendations. We want to increase the funding for the supervision, both grant programs, increase our funding for our mobile crisis teams so that they can actually respond like other first responders as quickly. Um, when we look at how much they get, which is about, you know, 20 some million dollars compared to what the police department in Minneapolis gets, I mean, and that, yeah, there's no comparison. Um, so we are coming um, to the key points in the legislative session. Um, the second deadline is March 24th, which means all those bills have to have been heard in both the House and Senate policy committees by that date. And then the budget bill deadline is April 4th, and so that's when they're going to finish up all their budget bills. Um, I have been lobbying um, since 1981, and I can tell you that your voice counts. You, and hardly anyone calls in on mental health. I'm just gonna be honest. So if a legislator gets 10 calls, they're gonna be like, wow, this is a big issue. And so I don't want people to feel like my voice doesn't matter, my call, my letter, my email isn't gonna matter because I'm there almost every day and I can see that it really does. And the only way that we're gonna create, right, a culturally informed and responsive and diverse workforce is if people tell their legislators how important this is. So I really wanna encourage you, I am um, never, um, you won't see me being very sarcastic about the legislative process because I see it work every single day. And so I think it's really important that we're all engaged in that process to move things forward. Um, NAMI Minnesota puts out a legislative update every Sunday um, that tells you more than you ever want to know about what bills have been introduced, what bills are in committees, what action is needed, and you can just sign up through our website, which is just namimn.org, and I would encourage you to do that. So thank you again for inviting me today. Good morning, everyone. Um, um, well, that is a hard act to follow. Actually, they're both hard acts to follow. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and I am so impressed with your work, Sue. Um, you are a tremendous asset to our state, if not our nation, and um, and to BIPOC communities everywhere. And other, um, you know, I hate the word disenfranchised and mi minoritized and marginalized and all those other things. These are communities that actually have not gotten invested in our um, nation for decades, if not eons and centuries. So they're disinvested communities, um, not marginalized. Structurally, they're intended to be um, done that way. So dismantling those structures within systems is really important. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that looks and how that shows up in my community that I serve, which is the Minneapolis um, and the American Indian community of the Twin Cities. Most of the people that we serve in my community clinic is um, are live in in and around about two mile radius of South Minneapolis. We're on the American Indian Cultural Corridor, um, and we've been there for 20 years. We just celebrated our 20th birthday um, on February um, 11th, our 13th. So, and tell everybody we're um, almost legal. Um, <laughs> um, so the title of my talk is ongoing, the ongoing, An Ongoing Sandemic, uh, The Impact of Public Health Crisis on Minnesota's First Peoples. Um, I also want to just really quickly set the, um, set the stage here to sort of kind of help everyone understand what a syndemic is. So a syndemic is mutually reinforcing interactions of disease and social conditions that kind of interact with each other and amplify the impact and the effect of all conditions um, on the communities that experience those things. 
And here, um, you know, my talk is really going to be talking about these four kinds of things that we're seeing really relevant and am amplified in the community that I serve, or that my clinic serves, and my people, um, our, 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 our clinic serves. And one of the things I think is important is um, you'll see that the words poverty and racism are there, sort of kind of on the background. And I think it's important to understand that these things are not sort of like operative um, uh, in a vacuum. They actually exist and are also given a lot of um, momentum and force and, um, and uh, cre create um, movement and become more powerful within the background the invisible background of systemic poverty and systemic racism that is built into the structures that um, you know, we've been talking about today. So, um, and, and those things are sort of kind of like, you know, it's like, it's like fish in a fishbowl. You don't see the water, like a lot of people don't see like the structural um, thing, things um, that sort of move these things in our communities. Oh, wrong direction. Um, in Minnesota, there are 11 tribal nations, all sovereign nations. Um, sovereignty is actually a really important concept to understand. Um, and um, one of the things I will tell you is if you are not a historian or you're not a student of history um, and you want to work in public health or you want to work in public policy or you want to do these kinds of things, I would encourage you to get a really great foundation in history because the laws that govern who we are as, um, uh, as cities, counties, states, nationhoods, they are born out of the concept of sovereignty and the principles of how people interact and establish laws and governance, right? So in Minnesota, there are 11 nations. Seven of them of there are Ojibwe or Anishinaabe, um, and those sort of kind of are um, situated to the north of um, the Twin Cities. There's four um, tribal nations that are just situated to the um, south, um, and those four are Dakota nations. In South Minneapolis, here's a map. Um, it's a little bit dated, but the data, I think, is pretty much the same. You will see that in the red areas, the, those are the highest concentrations of Native people living in Hennepin County, um, which is and, and adjacent areas like Ramsey County and sort of like the, the broader Severn County metro area. And that is the county, or those are, that's the service area that we provide, as well as Indian Health Board, which is their sister organization, um, four blocks to this, um, three blocks to the south of us. Um, Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minneapolis specifically, has the distinction of being the largest and most densely populated urban American Indian population um, in the United States. Um, there are other states, or there are cities that have larger populations of American Indians, but they're dispersed throughout um, the area. For instance, when I lived in Los Angeles, California for 18 years, we have a very large population, but over 4,000 square miles, they're kind of dispersed all over the place. So they don't have like a lot of centralized, um, in many ways, they don't have a lot of centralized focused um, political power and political clout. That's a little bit different in Minneapolis. Um, in the Twin Cities, or in Minnesota specifically, um, Native people are um, overrepresented in the unhoused population, and the unsheltered population, um, significantly greater than the rest of the um, uh, communities that we that, that are here in Minnesota, and in the Twin Cities specifically. Um, the health and edge, health and wealth gap between Native people and the rest of the population, writ large, not just here in Minnesota but across the nation, is demonstrative. You can see that, generally speaking, we make significantly less um, money um, in terms of per capita per household than the rest of the population of the United States, um, and that is. Um, no more true than than any other na um, state in the nation than it is in Minnesota. Minnesota has the great distinction of not just um, uh, being home to 11 nations and one of the largest densest populations of Native people. It also happens to have the distinction of being in 49th out of 50 states in terms of all kinds of health conditions and social and economic indicators as it relates to Native people. Meaning we graduate, we're 49th out of 50 states that graduate Native people. We're 49th out of um, 50 states in terms of the number of children that are in out of home placement. Um, uh, um, overwhelming abundance of people um, 
over representation in penal systems and ju juvenile and justice systems, and ju including juvenile justice systems, for some of the indications or some of the things that Sue talked about. I think it was must. Oh, okay. Um, one of the things I want to talk about specifically is um, about five years ago, practically to the date. Um, so in March of 2018, the spring of 2018. Um, the largest encampment that Minnesota has ever seen, the houseless, uh, of, of houseless and unsheltered people, broke out about four blocks to the east of my clinic, right across the street from the Community University Healthcare Center on Franklin Avenue in Bloomington. And the encampment was at Hiawatha and, um, and Franklin. And uh, at its largest um, size, which is late into um, the summer, around September 2018, there were about three to 400 people living in that encampment, probably primary, most of them primarily Native American, and they had taken up residence, living in about maybe 150 to 180 tents. Through the fall, the number of tents continued to grow to over 200 tents, um, and uh, so when I saw the Wall of Forgotten Natives and some of my outreach staff brought me there and I walked through it, I saw the living conditions that you would see and you would expect to see in developing countries. You know, those commercials that you see late at night, in the middle of the night when you're sort of like, you know, can't sleep. Um, you know, you see the puppies in the cages and then you see the poor people living in some, you know, third world uh, or developing country. Sorry, we don't say third world anymore. Um, but that was the conditions in which those people were living, and it was complete and utter squalor. Today, Native Americans represent one, four, one out of four people who are houseless in Minnesota. So this is what the Wall of Forgotten Natives looked like um, during that period of time. Um, these are some of the headlines. They gar this Wall of Forgotten Natives garnered local, regional, national, and sometimes international attention over the course of the six or seven months that it was operative, that it was continuing on. Um, in the same, at the same time, between December of 2018 and currently, so we're actually, this is old data, or is this slide, I meant to update it. It's, we're now about 55 months into a HIV outbreak in the Hennepin County and Ramsey County. Um, and the overwhelming preponderance of HIV outbreaks in our counties, meaning spikes, um, an outbreak is defined as um, the, uh, a greater number of um, more than double the amount of uh, incidence of infections that you would expect to have in a defined area. So during that period of time, that 36 month period, 85 confirmed HIV cases, um, were linked directly to um, uh, people who were living with, um, who were houseless, it, it, who were also people who were living with um, IV drug use, and an overwhelming number of those people were, Afri were Native American. You can see the rate per 1,000 is say, demonstratively larger than it is for any other population in our city and in our county. Um, so some of the things that contribute to um, higher rates of HIV infection include things like the lack of access to care, the lack of access to prevention services, um, and the lack of access generally to um, you know, homes, um, stable living conditions, all of these things create all kinds of barriers for people to actually get um, uh, the things that they need. <coughs> Um, they include also um, stigma and judgment from members of our community, members from our legislature, members from the county. One of the things that was so incredibly hard for me to manage was my own emo talk about you know talk about mental health distress and and, and, and and anxiety at that moment in time when I would read the comments. Like I'm just going to tell you right now, writ large, I tell everybody, do not read the comments section in any of the newspapers. It's like you know, there are a specific group of people, I think, who probably like make it their life's mission to make those comments. But reading those comments and the things that they would say about the people who are my relatives, not just, not just my relatives in the sense that, oh, Mataku Ace and we're all related, which is true, there were also people in the encampment that were my actual blood relatives. The day I took the tour with my outreach team and walked through that encampment, I saw a niece and her child there. 
I saw people I grew up with there. I saw elders who I went to school with in high school. I saw people who were my first and second and third cousins, like part of my extended family network, right? And it was, it, it, I was like, I left the encampment and I was, I was, I was cheerful and I was pissed off. And I went straight to my office and I picked up the phone and I called the mayor. Mr. Mayor, this is unconscionable. We are the, one of the wealthiest cities in the Midwest, if not the nation. You must do something about this, right? Um, so houselessness and substance abuse and mental health disorders are also a significant barrier. People are not going to be able to do things like get tested for HIV, accept care, get stable care, um, um, or for HIV or hepatitis C, which is also a significant increase in um, over the last five years due to IV drug use, and they're less likely to survive. Native Americans have um, a the potential for overdoses, both non-fatal and fatal overdoses, that are much larger than the rest of the population in the state. You can see here that this is a recent, so February 25th, I think, a few weeks ago. This is the national, um, and this is Nemesis, which is uh, Nemesis, which is the national um, monitoring emergency medicine and um, monitoring system for um, fatal and non-fatal overdoses. Um, this, and this is a, a snapshot of their um, their surveillance dashboard. And you can see that Hennepin County, and then several of the Native American or the uh, the tribal communities to the north really put Minnesota on the map in terms of opiate overdoses, right? And they are overwhelmingly um, specifically impacting the community that I come from and that I serve. Overdoses in Minnesota are 27% higher in 2020 than they were in 2019. That is probably and directly and indirectly related specifically to the pandemic. When the pandemic happened and it was announced when, you know, sort of like um, we went into lockdown mode in March of 2020. Does everybody remember that day? It was March 13th, right? Um, and NAC had to pivot overnight to telehealth. Thankfully, we had already had it in place. We had been doing some piloting with some of our tribal nation partners in the north delivering mental health services or trying to deliver psychiatry and mental health services there. So it was a really easy thing for us to do. But what was really challenging for people who were struggling with opiate use disorder was um, all of a sudden it was very hard to get Suboxone. Um, you know, and hard, hard to ensure that they were able to do those things. There were all kinds of laws and policies in place, you know, X waivers and all kinds of things. And providers generally already at that point in time, and even in the pandemic, we were well into the opiate crisis by this point, uh, what, 15 years? And an overwhelming number of providers did not want to be um, uh, X waivered uh, Suboxone prescribers. The pandemic only amplified that challenge and that problem. And then shortly thereafter, if you remember, um, we had um, the killing of George Floyd. And that um, you know, just decimated some of the, um, some of the um, uh, pharmacies in South Minneapolis, which is where we provide services. Um, m many of the Walgreens and the other pharmacies were either burned down or looted or um, destroyed, and which meant that for months, um, there was no place for our patients to get Suboxone if they um, had take-homes or they had um, prescriptions and had to go to the clinic or the pharmacy and pick those things up. So that was a real challenge. And, um, and it provided a burden on the community clinics in the South Minneapolis area for NAC, for Community University Healthcare Center, for um, People Center and all these other um, community health centers that provide really life-saving um, interventions for the people in our community. Um, so there's some one of, these are one of the, some of the ways in which the um, impact of the pandemic had um, the conditions of worsening um, already horrible mental health, substance abuse, and public health issues like HIV and infectious disease. Um, you know, 
um, service centers had to close, um, pharmacies had to close, um, people had to deliver those things either through telemedicine, which was not ideal. Um, you, we live in a very wealthy city, but you'd, you'd, and you'd expect a lot of people would have access to um, internet and technology, and they might have had smartphones, but they didn't have access to Wi-Fi, they didn't have access to cellular services, all kinds of things, and it made it delivering services to them significantly harder. And um, also the impact that COVID had on the Native community writ large across the United States, but here in the state of Minnesota, significantly greater impact on those communities um, because of lack of access to care and lack of access to, you know, finding a testing center and all those things. Within that system and or with that, within that two year or three year period, NAC, um, we had to, my clinic, we had to pretty much much redo our entire model of system of care. Um, we had been building some of this stuff already before the pandemic, so we were well situated. And I think one of the things that's, um, that was great about that experience was um, we were already sort of having some of these conversations about some of these challenges before the pandemic happened. And because we had been doing some of that work within our clinic, um, and we had done really intentional work about racial justice and increasing training in our workforce and a few other things. We were well situated to handle some of that stuff, but other organizations weren't. Our sister organizations who were not well prepared, who we rely on to provide um, care to people who have really um, um, horrible um, uh, access to um, things that would um, potent our moderates um, I hate this word, social, political determinants of health. Um, you know, they were struggling as well. And so our community writ large struggled. And so one of the things that we learned through the pandemic was, and both the Wall of Forgotten Natives and also the pandemic, was we found that when we went back to some of the ways that we have worked through all kinds of other challenges, practically since, if not actually since, colonization, those processes and those reliance on each other and the community and, and um, you know, our values and our way of um, taking care of one another really worked and helped us kind of get through those very difficult times. And so doing things like, you know, we had grandmothers and other people, like we couldn't get masks, right? Remember that period of time when, like, do you remember when you couldn't get toilet paper or masks? It wasn't that long ago, right? Um, you know, there's one guy in Prior Lake, which is where I live, he had like a garage filled with toilet paper. It was like insane. Um, anyway, but the point, <laughs> <laughs> but the point being is, thank God, I hope we never have to go back to that period of time, by the way. <laughs> Hopefully we learned our lessons. You know, Charmin, please, you know. You know if, there's, if there's a God, his name's got to be Charmin. Um, anyway, I joke. But the point is, is that, like, you know, communities came together. Grannies and other people in our community were sewing masks and dropping them off at the clinic. Um, they stepped up. They prepared meals. People were preparing meals and delivering them to elders who couldn't leave their homes. These are the ways in which community takes care of itself. And actually, when it came time to test, to, to, to move testing in our communities, and when it came time to actually deliver vaccines, tribal communities in the state of Minnesota, if not the nation, we did a better job doing that for our communities and for the communities that surround us than large health systems and large public health systems as well. So. We know a thing or two about taking care of your community. And one of the things I always tell like, you know, lobbyists and legislators and people who make really important decisions about money and about resources and things like that is like, you know what you're good at? You're good at passing bills and creating, sometimes they're good at passing bills and creating laws. But what we're, what we're good at is taking care of ourselves and taking care of one another. Give us what we need, get the hell out of our way and let us do what we know best because we're the experts in that area, not you. And so I think creating opportunities within public health structures to begin to sort of amplify that and recognize that people from the communities that they live in and that they work in and they socialize in and they have in, in deeply embedded relationships in, they know how to take care of one another. Like rely on them for guidance, rely on them for direction, and rely on them to f come up with s solutions that actually solve conditions in their in their communities. And then, 
you know, we are probably not going to see the end of the opiate crisis for at least 20 more years, right? Um, we're better off today than we were 15, 20 years ago. But I want to remind everybody that, you know, stigma is real. And that is the bigger driver of this problem than any other things, right? It's not the war at the border. It's not all these other things. It's like how much we as a society, um, um, how schizophrenic we are in terms of our sort of approach to some things that just make common sense. Take care of one another. Recognize that the people who are struggling with this are your brothers, your sisters, your aunties, your uncles, your grandmas and grandpas, and your children. And treat them like human beings and remember that they need connection, not more stigma and not more disconnection. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Nice to see you all here today. My name is Jeremy Hansen Willis. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the CEO of an organization called Rainbow Health. I'm very excited to be here today and to be a part of this uh, incredible panel and conversation, so thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be spending my time today talking a little bit about the work that Rainbow Health does, the disparities in health access and outcomes that we see in the communities that we serve, which are primarily lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, and other communities, as well as black, indigenous, people of color, and those at the intersection of all of those identities and also provides some research and examples of things that are happening right here in Minnesota to address these populations. First of all, a little bit about Rainbow Health. If you haven't heard of us before or don't know of us, we were actually founded in 1983 as Minnesota's first HIV AIDS organization, the Minnesota AIDS Project. And for the first three decades of our existence, we were focused on ending the HIV epidemic in Minnesota, which continues to be a core part of our mission today. But about five years ago, we merged with a couple of other smaller LGBTQ health and aging organizations that are today Rainbow Health, still working to end HIV, but recognizing that ending HIV means addressing other health inequities and injustices in the LGBTQ communities, communities affected by HIV and others with barriers uh, to access to health care. So taking the lessons that we've learned in fighting the HIV AIDS epidemic and broadening that to other health issues in the communities that we serve. Uh, so we're a group of passionate professionals working on health equity every day at the ground level. And at the core of what we do is help people with barriers to healthcare access and outcomes to navigate complicated healthcare systems um, by breaking down barriers. Again, especially for the populations that we have the experience in and serve every day, LGBTQ people, others affected by HIV, and those with barriers uh, to healthcare. We deliver our mission in two ways that I'll be talking about today. The first is to the direct delivery of compassionate and whole person care, a wide variety of uh, comprehensive services that address the whole person. But in addition to providing that direct care, we also work at a systems change level, right? All of you here understand that. Public health is a system. Healthcare is full of systems. And we know we can't serve every single person in the state of Minnesota. We also work at a systems level to try to improve and change those systems so that every person in our state can go to any clinic, any hospital, any treatment center, and get the high quality care that they need. Uh, this is just a sample of the more than 20 different services that we provide at Rainbow Health. We really view our work, as I said, through a whole person, whole care lens, which means that we see the entire person. And in particular, one of the words that is probably commonly used in the public health world is intersectionality. So there are lots of organizations that work in specific defined communities, cultural communities, demographic communities. And one of the things that we've learned in fighting HIV and we carry into our work today is those folks at the intersection of identities who have multiple barriers to health care. So when someone comes to Rainbow Health, we don't see them as one person, but we see their multiple identities and the multiple barriers that they have as a transgender African American woman living with HIV. Those are a lot of barriers to break down. It's not just about race or gender or sexuality or health status, but really thinking about how those multiple barriers overlap. 
The second part of whole person care is understanding that there are many different facets to health care, right? Um, if you don't have a stable place to live, you don't have good health care. If you don't have insurance, you don't have access to good health care. So it's not just about having a doctor. It's about having a home. It's about having economic stability um, and all of those other things. So this is a sample of the programs that we provide that we think both address that whole person and whole person care in our system. So I'll be talking a little bit about these today, but in particular going to be focusing this conversation on the work that we do uh, in mental health and how that's part of our holistic system. The first thing I want to do, though, is ground us a little bit in the reality of Minnesota. One of the parts of our organization uh, is research. So we conduct annual ongoing research here in Minnesota for the last 10 years called the Voices of Health Project. And you can go to our website, rainbowhealth.org, and go back a decade to see data over time of the Voices of Health Project, which is a community-based research project that um, is a survey that anywhere between 1,500 and 3,000 LGBTQ Minnesotans take every year. We do this uh, in person at Pride and other community festivals around the state, and certainly over the last couple of years, a lot of it online as well. And so it's through this very comprehensive, like 50 question survey, that we get information about uh, health issues and barriers to health in our community and the diversity within our community around age, race, gender, and so forth. So a couple of the statistics that I have up on the screen here that you can see give us a sense of the kind of disparities and barriers that are special and in some ways unique to LGBTQ populations and the diversity therein. First, recognizing, as I said, there's economic issues in our community, that LGBTQ populations are more likely to be below the average income, more likely to have experienced homelessness and housing instability, more likely have been challenged with putting food on the table. Um, and so we start with those economic issues. And one of the things that we do at Rainbow Health is financial assistance and rental assistance, those basic economic aids to help someone put food on the table, pay for their medications, pay for their rent, pay for their phone bill, and so forth. You'll also notice that a, a significant proportion of our community does not have health insurance. Almost a third of our community does not have health insurance. And as you know, if you don't have insurance, you don't really have access to health care. And when we talk about mental health, 80%, four out of five LGBTQ Minnesotans in our survey, experienced moderate to severe mental health distress. And while this has been an ongoing concern, as you've already heard about today, there are enormous pressures on LGBTQ, especially trans and non-binary people in our society today. You can't turn on your computer or open a newspaper without seeing another headline of people trying to eradicate and erase and criminalize trans and other uh, LGBTQ people. So it's not only the difficulty of being a trans or queer person, which is difficult enough, but the pressures that society is putting on these folks right now are leading to what many people, myself, would say is a mental health crisis in our community, especially as it relates to young people. And as you can see in, in the last bullet point here, that this is not surprisingly an even worse issue for the T in the LGBTQ, the trans and queer folks in our community. Again, talking about some of the barriers that folks from our community experience. So even if they have the confidence, the ability, and the wherewithal to seek care, there are other barriers that make it difficult for them. 27% of the folks in our survey said they needed a doctor in the last year, but didn't go because of cost or because they would be mistreated. So people and 48%, this is the underlying number, almost half of the folks in our survey have had a provider, a healthcare provider, refuse them treatment because they were LGBTQ. And 45% who had a provider use harsh or abusive language when treating them. Now, if you had been treated in this way, and maybe some of you in this room or on the screen have, but if you haven't, think about what it would be like to go to a doctor again after that kind of negative experience, when half of the folks in our survey said they'd had that experience. 48% had been verbally harassed in a healthcare setting. 43% had, had a provider be physically rough or physically abusive with them. This is unacceptable 
reality in Minnesota today. And of course, again, transgender folks have a higher rate of severe mental illness as a result. Now, of all of the communities uh, that we address at Rainbow Health, the one that I would like to take a few minutes to talk about today that doesn't get enough attention um, is our aging and older adult population. Um, like all parts of Minnesota's population, uh, the LGBTQ population is aging. It's the fastest growing demographic in LGBTQ and HIV communities, and LGBTQ adults ages 50 and over will double in the next 10 years. So it's a rapidly growing part of the queer community. But as you can imagine, or maybe surprised to know, a lot of these older adults have increased isolation and loneliness. Only half as many of LGBTQ older adults have a friend or close relative that they can call on. 40% versus more than 92% in the broader population. So when you have that family support around you, it makes a big difference as a care provider or a care needer. And so a much smaller proportion of LGBTQ older adults are aging alone in their own homes. 35% have no children, only 35% have children compared to 85% in the broader population of Minnesota. So this, a lot of older adults face isolation and loneliness already. And again, that's multiplied um, for the folks in our community who are aging with HIV or aging as a queer adult. And part of that reality is that we have a, a senior care system that is not equipped with or meeting the needs of this population. Whether it's in-home care providers, someone coming to your home to care for, for you, or um, we, if you go to a senior housing or an institutional setting, um, a lot of folks are very concerned. Now, 92% of the folks we surveyed said they would sure appreciate and be much more likely to go to a place that had been trained in addressing the needs of LGBTQ folks, but the reality is not nearly enough of that is happening. About four years ago, we conducted uh, another research project called the Transgender Aging Project, which held uh, interviews and small focus groups with transgender Minnesotans, older adults all over the state. And it's qualitative data, but some of the comments and experiences recorded in that report are just truly heartbreaking. People who said that they have no faith in the senior care system. And these, again, are people with multiple identities and multiple barriers who are filled with fear about how they're going to be cared for as they age. People who said, I will step in front of a bus before I will go into a senior home. People who said they have no hope about how they'll be cared for. So these are very real barriers that people in our community face, and that, of course, affects their mental health and their whole health. So I want to talk a little bit more about the rainbow health model, this whole person care model. So as I mentioned, there's really two parts, looking at um, everything I've talked about. And again, when someone comes to us, we see them as a whole person and the multiple levels of identities that they have. And these are the people that we've seen since 1983. Um, and then the other part is looking at them, at, the, at their needs, their health care needs, not just through a lens of mental health care or transportation or insurance, but whatever door that they come in, they get into our system that makes sure that they have all of those needs. So if they come to a peer support group, is an opportunity to find out, are they connected to care? Do they have health insurance? How did they get there that day? Was it difficult to get there via transportation? Um, and all the other things that they do. Our approach is trauma-informed. So our staff, especially our mental health staff, but broadly throughout the organization, we go through regular um, and a lot of opportunities to train our staff about trauma and how do we be more trauma-informed. And as you know, that's because the communities that we serve have experienced multiple levels and experience every day today multiple levels of trauma and generational trauma. Our approach is also harm reduction based. Um, so we work with where people are at and help them to become healthier. And that means a lot of different things for different people. We're inclusive and meet people where they are at their point in their life. And as I said, we provide both this direct care to help people and systems change, whether it's lobbying at the legislature, um, having our lawyers uh, work with 
or challenge insurance companies to make sure that they're covering the things that they should be covering for. We're talking in a lot of parts of the country right now about denying basic gender-affirming care, which thankfully is not the case in Minnesota, reaffirmed by our governor just last week. But even if that care is available, all too often insurance companies don't want to pay for it. And so we have lawyers on staff that advocate for those folks, say, nope, it says right there your insurance pays for this gender-affirming care. So that kind of systems change as well as the direct work that we do. So lastly, I just want to leave you a few thoughts about what you all can do to be a part of this effort of caring for yourselves and others in the diverse LGBTQ communities. And the first is to take care of yourself. We've been through a lot these last couple of years. Our world has been turned upside down. And just a reminder that you can't do anything for anyone else until you take care of yourself. Second is take care of each other. There are so many barriers to someone walking into one of our therapist's office. So many barriers. Barriers that they have, barriers that they've experienced. And a lot of times they need that nudge from a friend or a family member. So if you see someone who's a friend or a family member or a classmate who you think is not doing so well, talk to them and say, how are you doing? Do you, do you need some help? Going to a therapist is really not that scary. And there are places that are equipped especially to work with you. So be that friend and take care of each other and be that nudge that sometimes people need. Third is educate yourself. If there's anything we learned about intersectionality and multiple identities is that even if we're black or gay or transgender does not mean our experiences are the same for everyone else in that category. So we have to constantly be learning about other people in our community, other people who might even look or act like us because their experiences are different. If there's anything that we've learned in our work around racial equity in particular, it's these levels of identity that we need to address, and it's constant education of ourselves. And then lastly, as public health professionals or future public health professionals, take that knowledge and put it to work in your community. Part of our job as public health professionals is we're a little bit more knowledgeable about resources that are out there in the community, a little bit more aware you're here today and you've, you've heard about some of the community resources. Don't just hold that inside. Find ways to share it and educate others in our community. Education is an interpersonal process. And so the more that we share about these opportunities in our community. So take care of yourself, take care of those around you, continue to educate and challenge yourself and then share that education with those around you. So hopefully uh, that helps to give a little perspective. If you want to learn more about the work of Rainbow Health or get involved in any way, uh, visit our website or feel free to send me an email and I look forward now to our panel conversation. I'd like to give another round of applause if we could for our wonderful speakers. They were fantastic. I'd like to invite our speakers back up to the stage. And for folks in the room, I would invite you to ask questions in a couple different ways. You can see we have some microphones set up right here at the front. Um, if you are comfortable stepping forward, I can just call on people who are in the room. We also have uh, I believe some folks are moving around with, um, with index cards and pencils, so if that is a better way for you to ask a question, feel free to grab one of those, write your question, pass it back, and we'll have somebody ask it from the moderator's booth. And then for folks online, we know questions have been coming in on the chat, so Sarah is going to be compiling some of those and we'll be asking those as we go along as well. All right, I will start us off with some questions that have come in already. Um, the first thing that I would like to ask about is in thinking about the number of different issues and the number of different concerns that people are working on that are related to mental health, but in kind of different ways, it's, it's really easy to get siloed um, in, in seemingly distinct issues like housing and hate crimes and healthcare access. So I would like to hear our panelists speak a little bit on what you can do in terms of coalition building to bring folks together from all of these seemingly different kind of issue, issues and areas. How do you bring people together to make deep and lasting change? Well, I can start. Um, so there is a thing in 
Minnesota um, uh, called the Mental Health Legislative Coalition. And then it's over 40 organizations, and we all work together. Um, part of it is kind of making sure we're not airing our dirty laundry in public when we disagree on bills. But this session in particular, because there were over 50% of the legislators were new. So we decided that none of us were going in with our own bills. And so we all came in together. So we actually have 18 bills covering every different issue you can think of, you know, education, higher education, you know, equity, workforce, housing, employment, the whole shebang. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we try to do that. And some of the agencies that are involved, you know, also have housing and things like that. So they're a really kind of broad coalition of groups. So. It's one of the ways that we can do that. Yeah, I think the question has this strong assumption that yes, coalitions are necessary, collaboration is necessary. Um, as a, a former community organizer, you know, and as you see in politics on the news, uh, there's strength in numbers. And so the more people you can get together for your project or purpose, the stronger and more effective that you'll be. The reality is coalitions are really hard and a lot of work especially when you're working with communities that are traumatized communities, have barriers, getting those folks together to agree is difficult. And so a couple of the things that I've learned over time about building coalitions is um, make sure that there's a clear sense of purpose. Um, you're right, there are a lot of different issues that you might come together around, a lot of different issues that will come up in the process, but develop a, a consensus-oriented process to say, what are we really here for in this moment and in this group? Second, to also remember that part of what might bring people to a table is some self-interest. Um, it's not just the, a cause for housing or access to mental health. Sometimes organizations are part of a coalition because they want to get closer to one other organization in the coalition. Or they're a small organization and they want to be more known. Or they're a big organization and they want to be seen as helping small organizations. So there are lots of different reasons why people would join a coalition, and that's okay. What's important is getting them to the table, having a clear sense of purpose, and then checking in on that purpose on a regular basis while also recognizing that there might be other motivations under the surface of what bringing people back to the table. Yeah, I would agree with the other panelists. Um, it's important to join coalitions and just be in the same room uh, at, at a given time for dinner or for coffee. That, I always find that to be helpful when developing academic and community partner relationships. Um, but there are times when uh, disagreements will happen. Oh, sorry. Uh, there, <laughs> there are times. I'm the picture, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are times when disagreements happen. And, you know, sometimes uh, the structural forces that are in place want our our communities to fight against each other for limited resources. And that's just the way um, structures have been in place for generations. And, uh, but we need to stick together on, on similar issues and understand that sometimes we'll not always uh, get along or, or, or be on the same side on a particular issue. Uh, but just um, staying together is important. Yeah, I would agree with all the comments that everyone's made. I think um, finding, um, key issues that you can agree on and some agreement on um, a path to move forward. So like there is a lot of issues and you can get sort of kind of a nerd and distracted by like, you know, the plethora of them, but really sort of kind of building your coalition around one or two specific issues um, that are, um, you can create some actionable items from and, um, and, and building momentum and movement from there. And I think what happens is you get a bunch of people in the room and you start to have conversation and you hopefully also establish early on a set of um, uh, operating principles that you all can agree on. Like we're gonna, you know, everybody's idea has some value, everybody's voice is important, those kinds of things. We're gonna have some disagreements, but here's how we're gonna manage those things. And just having some real clear ways of how you do that is really important. And then I think the other piece I would say is like, you know, is bringing in the voices of community. A lot of people who build coalitions are organizations and people who have lack access to a lot of resources and because it does take resources to build those things. But then also remembering to bring in the voices of the people that you actually serve, people on the ground, people who are actually sort of being impacted by the decisions that you're making because they sometimes have ideas and thoughts that you might not have thought about or that you might not have heard and they have an important, an important contribution to make as well. And um, 
you know, like any relationship, I think of coalition building a lot like, you know, any kind of relationship, specifically a marriage and if it, or a relationship. If you haven't had one of those, um, you know, hopefully you will at some point in time. But it's basically like having discussions and coming to uh, agreement about principles of how you're going to treat one another and conduct um, the work that you do collaboratively. Um, and that's a really important piece to it. And if you're working in communities of color, um, Bring food. People will show up for food. <laughs> they will. They'll absolutely show up for food. In fact, they actually expect it, right? It's like, you know, go to your grandma's house or you go to your auntie's house. What do you expect? Some food, right? It's kind of the same principle. So. Can I add one more comment? You know, so I'm an academic outside the fishbowl and watching you guys in action. And for this is a lesson for our public health students. When you are executives and managers and have leadership roles in, in community organizations, like those that we've learned today, make partnerships across each other with your leaders. You know, I, am, I imagine that that there's a, I can already see a strong connection across these three sitting, at, uh, sitting with me at this table. They know each other, they work together on similar issues, and that's something that our, that's a lesson for our public health students in the room. Good observation. Yes, mm -hmm. it's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank um, you. It's great to have concrete suggestions. I knew that was going to be a hard question right out the gate because it's a really, you know, coalition building has lots of challenges. Yeah. But I appreciate hearing some, some good strategies. If I can just interrupt you, I do actually have to apologize to the audience here and then also the people online that I do have to leave early today because, in addition to the Public health, the only other thing that's more important in the state of Minnesota is actually hockey, and my children are in the <laughs> My child is playing in the state playoff at <laughs> noon, and I got to be there. <laughs> or, or, if I, or if I'm not, I might have a health crisis of my own because it would be really <laughs> so, so I apologize for having to leave, and if there are questions specifically addressed to me, um, I'll take one really quickly, but also like they can be emailed to me. and. You know, people have access to my email address. You can email me, and I'd be happy to answer online, too. Great. Thanks for letting us know sure. that. Anyone in the room have questions that they want to come to the microphone? There's a microphone up front, please. Thank you. appreciate you all talking about the disparities our communities are facing. And one question particularly for American Indian families who are homeless, can't we have solutions? I mean, like uh, portable small homes. I was reading yesterday mm -hmm. about California bringing many of them. Mm -hmm. Can we think about it? Because this state says we are in abundance. We have the money. So where is the money being used? So can we bring those homes for people being yeah. homeless? Thank you for asking that question. Thank you know, I think it's really important that we understand something, right? We live in one of the wealthiest na nations in the country, or in the world. We live in one of the very, we have a, Minnesota, we have an abundance of wealth here, quite frankly. And I also want to parenthetically state here really quickly is that the wealth of this great state was built specifically off land theft and a bunch of other um, things that happened to the indigenous peoples of this state, right? So recognizing that and understanding that is really important. That's why I said, like, you know, consume history and understand what history is. How, how the route that we got here, um, you know, have you ever gotten lost somewhere? Like, um, you know, the route, understanding the route of how you got to some place and looking, be able to look backwards and figure out how you get back out is a really important thing. It's the same principles that apply to this condition. And one of the things I would say specifically is like, you know how you end houselessness, specifically for people who have no resources and no assets and, ha and, and practically nothing? You give them a house. If, you, if they have no house, give them a house. Like if we gave every single person and every family who is struggling with houselessness um, their, a home, not just a place to live, but a home, they would have instantaneous um, equity. They've had resources to money. They'd have a stable place to live. They'd be able to sort of leverage those things. So the things that m many of the people in our, on, in our state who have generational wealth, they can go out and take a loan. Mom and dad, aunties, uh, grandmas and grandpas, give them money to sort of put down their phone, uh, on their homes to buy those things. We don't have those things in, in, um, in marginalized communities, right? So 
the opportunities to do those things, to create that generational wealth, to create the stability and to have that long term for themselves and their families, that's not going to exist. And for Native people, specifically in the state of Minnesota, it doesn't exist for a reason. It's called colonization and it's called land theft and it's called policies for hundreds of generations that have actually disempowered and disincentivized and disinvested and actually marginalized people with intent. So correct that. Mm. We have the most money in the state of Minnesota than we've ever had in its history, right? Like we've never been here before, ever. Minnesota's had a lot of firsts over the last couple of years. So give everybody a tiny, tiny house. How much can that cost, right? It certainly is less expensive than institutionalizing them and imprisoning them and doing all these other things. So it's a simple solution. Mm. <laughs> anyway. Take care. Everyone have a great day. It's a great day for hockey. <laughs> Thank Thanks, Thanks for being with us, Anthony. Another question for the group. Um, Jeremy especially touched on the issue and the idea of intersectionality. So this idea that people's experiences are shaped by multiple layers of marginalization. Um, some combination of racism and xenophobia and homophobia and transphobia and other forms of structural oppression that they experience simultaneously. So I'm wondering if other folks on the panel can say a little bit more about how you see these intersecting oppressions play out in the communities that you serve and in the work that you do, and, and specifically how can you work to, to address these complex factors? Mm. Do you want to go first? Oh, okay. Sure. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, in my presentation, you know, we talked about the disparities and it's overlapping, right? So that, you know, we certainly see, um, you know, again, people from BIPOC communities, LGBTQ communities, right, not being able to access the care that they need. And that is that intersectionality there. Um, and, I, and I do think creating new models of care, so it's not just, again, have this long diagnostic assessment and then you get a treatment plan. There are, there are ways that we can intervene much earlier and provide that kind of support um, without doing a full-blown DA. And I think the other thing is really providing, um, not only getting, of course, uh, culturally diverse providers, but then going to where people are. And I think that's why the schooling program is so effective. We're not waiting for kids to come to a clinic. We're going where they are. Mm -hmm. We're not going to wait uh, for people who you know, are unhoused or rough sleepers, you know, as the new book is called. Um, we're going to where they are. And so I think the more that we do that and go into unconventional places, um, that that will help. Now, there's a lot of work that we need to do to make that happen, including all of the programs that fund like supervision the Merck program, the federal you know, national health service loan, they require you to be in clinic, in a building. And that, I think, is going to be a huge barrier that we need to address. In the um, policy, uh, public policy and health policy space, I see intersectionality play out at the local level and at the federal level in a few ways. At the local level, I see it come up in book bans where mm -hmm. school districts are banning certain books on, on racism or lessons on, uh, you know, even children's books about two penguins, two male penguins raising oh, a, a baby penguin, uh, you know, and, and, and banning To Kill a Mockingbird. And so I see some of this um, at, the, at the local level where, you know, they're banning issues on race and on sexuality and on gender. But at the federal level, in terms of marriage, um, intersectionality plays out in, in recently in um, a, the, uh, the Mar uh, Protection for Marriage Act, which requires states to uh, recognize not only same-sex marriages, but also interracial marriages. And I worry that given the makeup of the Supreme Court, that some of these issues could be overturned and back to the states. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be up to states to decide whether to, to legalize same-sex marriages and to continue to recognize interracial marriages. And there's certainly some inter intersectional issues. I'm in an in a interracial same-sex marriage, and that's something that I worry about. Um, if I could add a little bit more. Someone says, 
intersectionality, I'm like moth to a flame. I just have to talk about it some more. <laughs> um, but I, I really appreciate the question because it's, it's kind of a lingoistic word. We don't use intersectionality when we're working with clients. Um, and so it's, I think it's great to have a question say, how does this really play out in the real life? And so obviously this is something at Rainbow Health that we see every day and the people that we serve. But just one of many examples I could give that really strikes me is our uh, transitional housing program. So transitional housing is that we help someone who is not stably housed get into a home uh, and we subsidize that rental home for up to two years and we work with that person and the landlord to make that relationship successful. Uh, and the, the program was created back in the 80s um, because people with HIV were experiencing a lot of housing discrimination and needed that extra assistance and extra boost. But today, in 2023, the folks that we work with, um, the, the HIV status is not the barrier. The barrier is that they have a criminal history. And so they have irregular income. They have irregular rental history. Uh, they're black, indigenous, a person of color who still experiences racism. They're a trans person who's afraid to talk to the landlord because they don't know how they're going to react to their trans identity. So those are the experiences that we work with today. And I think there's two things that we learn from an experience like that. One is to assume that this person is, has experienced multiple levels of trauma. So when we're working with that person in our brains, we're assuming that they've experienced a lot of trauma in their life. The other assumption that we make is we don't know what kind of trauma they've really experienced. So we need to be really open-minded when we see someone. We don't know initially why they're here because of a criminal history, their person of color, their transgender, until we begin to talk to them and build a relationship with them. And so I think that's an example where we have to take those two assumptions, meet that person where they are. They came to us because they need a place to live, and we need to advocate with that landlord and say, we're going to work with them, we're going to pay their rent, we're going to make it work. And also build confidence in that person who have been probably rejected multiple times by landlords, which is why they're in this situation. So I think taking those two assumptions and seeing those people is one example how we can house you know, two to three hundred people a year who are exactly living that intersectionality. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have another question that came uh, in advance as people were registering for the event. Why do you think public health has been so behind in embracing mental health and mental well-being as a core public health issue? Funding. Uh, <laughs> funding. <laughs> funding, mental health services, mental health training, um, mental health <laughs> clinics have been underfunded for the last 50 years, um, and I think funding is a big issue uh, with, with mental health, but we have experts here who, 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 who may disagree. Well, I can tell you, when I you know, worked on my master's here, there was not one class that ever mentioned mental health. Not one. Mm -hmm. Now it was a while ago, but still not one. Um, and, and I think part of it is that we have um, forgotten you know, that our head is connected to the rest of our body, and I also think in the, in the field of public health that the focus has been on primary prevention and not secondary and tertiary. But yet those are a really still important piece of public health because yes, we can walk in the woods and you know, de-stress and do all that to try to prevent people from struggling with their mental health, but there are risk factors, right? And then we also need to think on the other end, you know, people develop schizophrenia and we need to make it um, and provide enough services so that it doesn't become a disabling condition. So I think we've just limited our view about health to not include our brains and, and then again just focus on primary prevention and forgotten the rest. Mm -hmm. And I would add that, I agree with all of that, I would add that um, to give yourselves a little grace in the public health community, um, you're not isolated on your own planet, you're on this planet. And as Sue said, our culture and our society has not recognized mental health in the ways that it should, which is why I'm so excited to, to, to be alive and to be active in this moment. Um, because as I think you've probably seen, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest this, over the last two to three years with the pandemic and the racial reckoning that we've all experienced, mental health is now high on the radar. True. Um, the governor and the legislature are talking about historic investments in mental health. 
We're having this conversation. There are startups and virtual health companies popping up every day responding to mental health. The mental health industry has exploded in size. Our program at Rainbow Health went from two therapists to 15 therapists as a nonprofit in the span of three years. So mental health is on the radar and it's within the context of racial equity and health equity. These are words we were not talking about four years ago. We're talking about them today. So there's an opportunity now to push this conversation further than it's been pushed before. So I've been in politics my whole career and I know politics is always about timing, right? It's about timing. So there is a moment here that we have to grasp that people are talking about health equity, talking about racial equity, and talking about mental health. So let's take that and make sure that we have sessions at conferences, that we have conferences dedicated, we have classrooms dedicated to it, because there's a lot more interest in this than there was before. And that's exciting. And if I could just say one more thing, for the public health students in the audience, either here or on Zoom, there's been a generational shift in conversations around mental health, uh, destigmatizing mental health, and it's really the young people who have made themselves vulnerable, who are open to talking about their depression, their anxiety, the, the, the effects of being bullied either online or in person. And we need to make sure that our, our young public health professionals keep pushing uh, for mental health as part of the discipline. Thank you very much. Cool. Anyone else in the room? Would you please come up to a microphone? Thanks. Hi. Thanks so much for being here. I've appreciated what I've heard from all of you guys. Um, I'm, my name is Desiree. I'm a sociology PhD student. I'm a first year PhD student um, here at University of Minnesota. And so um, I have been thinking a lot about a medicalized model of mental health recently. Um, which seemed to be embedded in each of, in everyone's kind of conversation about public health and mental health this morning. Um, I see a really clear connection between medicalizing mental health and kind of this cultural shift that you guys were just talking about, right? Um, it's given it a sense of legitimacy mm -hmm. um, and allowed us to embrace it as, like you said, a, a, an essential part of the human being, right? So my question to you then is, um, as public health and out in the field kind of doing public health, do you see an opportunity for um, a not medicalized view of mental health to be deployed? And by that, I mean specifically taking into consideration the fact that the medical health system here in the United States um, is broken. <laughs> um, we don't do it well. Um, the populations that we do serve, we don't serve them well. Um, and it's well known um, that we don't, we, we don't serve anyone very well. So um, how are you guys thinking about kind of alternative methods? I know kind of you, someone mentioned sh working with shamans. I can't remember who it was, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. So our mental health system isn't broken. It was never built. The institutions were not a mental health system. Um, I think it's, it's not a, or it's an and. So, because these are real illnesses. I have family members who've had, you know, serious mental illnesses, and I have seen medication and therapy really work. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's important. And we do know that how you involve someone with schizophrenia is going to be different than involving someone with anxiety. So, you know, diagnosing, especially those serious mental illnesses, is really important because there are evidence-based treatments that can really help. But taking a pill is not the only Thing that you have to do, right? You have to think about, you know, what am I eating? Am I drinking too much, right? Am I, you know, am I moving during the day to get those endorphins going in our brain? Am I lonely? Am I connected to someone? Do I have housing? Do I have a reason to get up in the morning? People with serious mental illnesses have the highest unemployment rate, and yet we know that having a job, you know, you have a reason to get up in the morning. You have structure to your day. It can be a really important piece. So I don't, um, I, I think it's okay to medicalize mental illnesses. They are real illnesses, but we, as with anything, like heart disease, right? You can't just take that blood pressure and, and cholesterol medication. You have to do other things. And so I think we just have to broaden um, how we think about treatments for mental illnesses. If you think about some of the um, first episode programs for psychosis, the Navigate, for example, they don't just give the person a medication. 
right? I mean, they make sure they do, you know, cognitive remediation on the computer. They make sure um, there's peer support. They make sure the families understand what's going on and how to help. They make sure that person gets back to school or work. And so they really take, I think, a more holistic view about how do we really support someone through, frankly, a very, very serious illness. Um, you know, I think uh, we've seen a lot of people with anxiety and depression, I'm just going to quick take a med. You have to do more than that. And so that's, that's where I kind of fall into this, is that it's and, it's not or. Well, Sue took all the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. I do think it's both and. And I think in part of the rise right now we've seen in the mental health industry, I talked about exploding, not all those startups are quality startups. Um, and a lot of people are sort of getting into the field to make money versus help people. And so I think within medicalization, um, there have to be good standards. I mean, people still need to get a license. They need to be trained. We can't just hire anyone to be a therapist because they're a good listener. You know, they, the, so I think there is part of it that's a both and. It, people need to be trained. There do need to be good standards. Those standards, though, should include other things than a narrow medical model. Um, to the examples that Sue mentioned. I think the other kind of branch I would take on this, to not repeat what Sue said, is also thinking about the financial models of medicine, um, which is a big challenge. You know, as a, as a mental health care provider, we have to think about insurance and what insurance will take. What will insurance pay for? Do we have a fair contract with all the insurance companies? And we do have contracts with all insurance companies, so if someone has insurance, um, they can, we can take that. But as I said, a significant part of our community does not have health insurance. And so one of the things I think is special about our model is that we're a nonprofit. And so we're the largest nonprofit LGBTQ mental health care provider in Minnesota. And being a nonprofit means that we don't turn anyone away for their inability to pay. That we raise money and donations and get a community of support to make sure that people can get that mental health care even if they don't have insurance. Now, we'll also help get them on insurance uh, to our benefits team, uh, but I think uh, thinking outside the narrow business model as well as the medical model to say, how do we pay for this, um, which is also a fractured and broken system to make sure that someone gets the quality care that they need, and there's always a dollar sign attached to that. So thinking about new models like community-based um, nonprofit models that are also high quality and provided by experts. I want to, oh, go ahead. Please. I just want to add one thing, and that is that um, in 2007, we actually moved most of mental health services to Medicaid and Minnesota Care so you could bill insurance. And the reason was is that before that, it was basically funded through grants to the county. The counties were the mental health authority. And if you went and wanted an assertive community treatment team and the county was out of money, that was it. Um, and so, and there was actually a part in the statute that says within available appropriations, which means they didn't have to do it. So actually moving to insurance actually provided a more um, reliable stream of funding than the grant funding. And when, after we moved that, we hit the recession and most of the grant funding for mental health was cut substantially across the country. So it's, it's kind of like we, we don't want to depend on grants. We think, I think, more about braided funding in the mental health world, mm -hmm. right? But we do need to have that steady stream of money that you get through insurance um, because relying on grants is what led us to not even developing a mental health system. Absolutely. And the only thing I would add is that it's important to meet people where they are outside the clinic. And so mm -hmm. I wish we had more research and experiments on, on um, non-clinical mental health care and services broadly defined. Um, and some examples that I've seen in uh, Tennessee and Nashville is um, training peer support uh, mm -hmm. uh, community partners. So building off models from uh, uh, what we call promotores, uh, Hispanic uh, uh, women who, who reach out to their communities. But what we've seen in the African American community and experiments in the black community in Nashville is that they're training barbershop, uh, barbers and, 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 and folks at the salon how to talk to their clients about their mental and emotional health. Um, I think we need to also, just like try new things at the workplace where we, where most of us spend our, our times, not at home but at work, and um, and thinking about um, creative solutions to meet people where they are. Great, thank you very much. Good. Um, we're going to go to a question uh, that came in from Zoom. 
Um, from an equity standpoint, we, want, we hear about disparities, but I would also want to hear about assets. So mm -hmm. this questioner was interested in hearing more about the positives and the strengths mm -hmm. in the communities that you work with, since um, kind of an all disparities focus has not been as effective in bringing mm -hmm. about change. I love that question. <laughs> so thank you, um, because I think at, at the core, the fact that there are still proud, confident trans people in America today is a testament to exactly that. Um, with all of the, the pressures and the bigotry and the violence uh, projected onto people, um, this, we are resilient people. And we are a creative people. And I think another example of this is thinking back, I'm looking at a wide variety of ages in here, but those of you who are aware of the early AIDS movement, um, and the activism connected to the AIDS movement, shutting down the FDA, um, shutting down corporations, and not just doing that, but doing that with creativity and flair that completely redefined activism in this country. Mass die-ins in the street where people would carry graves and had red paint on their hand that they're slapping onto government buildings to say we're dying and the government's not doing anything, the government has blood on their hands. Very creative, resilient activism. It also, and I've seen this in other of our chemical health and substance abuse work, um, redefine what it means to be a patient advocate. You know. People with HIV and AIDS created a community, and the LGBTQ community created a family of support, and we took care of each other, and we gave each other confidence, and people started demanding treatment um, of their doctors and saying, this is how I need to be treated, this is the medicine that I know exists, and it redefined. So I think that there are lots of examples in the LGBTQ community, and you're seeing it today um, across the country, trans people stepping up other folks in the LGBT community stepping up, allies stepping up. And so the fact that we are still here and queer and trans is a testament to the resilience and beautiful strength that we have as a community. Um, and as I said, when we do that, we reshape um, other systems. We reshape what it means to be an activist. We reshape what it means to be a patient. And that changes systems that we can appreciate today that happened in the past and what's happening today will change the future. I agree, 1,000%. Um, but Jeremy said a word that I think is uh, starting to become less popular in the academic space, and that word is resiliency. I think a lot of us are tired of being resilient and are exhausted. I am tired of being resilient these last 10 years, <laughs> and I, 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 and so, and it puts, it puts too much, too many expectations on the individual to survive in an environment that is making it difficult for them to live and thrive and survive. And so, um, I think we need to use our assets, including allyship and collaboration, to change some of the structural barriers to our, our survival. And some of it may be just political rhetoric. You know, when I was here and uh, doing my PhD at, at, the, at the U, um, we, uh, we uh, passed marriage equality and we used language like the freedom to marry. And I think we need to re, uh, just reframe and rethink what that freedom is. And that freedom often requires us just to be ourselves. I just, many of us just want to be free to be ourselves and to survive and thrive. Um, and I think a lot of that comes through allyship, and that's a big asset that I, I, I see for all of our communities. You know, sometimes I go back to um, ACEs, right, where we kind of, you know, how many, you know, um, adverse experiences has a child experienced, and how can we make them be resilient? And then the other side of it is, how can we reduce some of those adverse childhood experiences? Um, some you can't, you know, but there are ones that you can. And I think it's also looking at, for various communities, what are those things that really do support people? I think of the black churches as a mm -hmm. way that we really kept people connected to each other so there wasn't that loneliness and isolation that went with it. Um, I think in the Latinx community, having multi-generational households means that someone is, if they're not doing well with their mental health, they're not necessarily living alone. And I really don't, you know, and this is true, frankly, in the disability and the mental health movement, like the goal is to live by yourself. Um, 
So and, until my husband died, I've never lived by myself. <laughs> Ever and so I don't know why that becomes the norm necessarily, um, but you know it can be hard to live alone when your symptoms make it even harder to reach out. So I think um, I think it is important to kind of identify some of those things in different cultures that actually mm -hmm. um, support people um, in a different way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love these responses. A lot of my own work focuses on um, protective factors, is kind of the wording we use, but these strengths and these assets, especially in young people. And reframing to focus on the positive just changes the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate these examples. And thank you for the question to, uh, to our Zoom participant who put it in. Um, anyone else in the room want to come forward with a question? Please do. One of my college buddies went on to be a psychiatrist. He's at uh, Dartmouth. I think he's probably mostly retired now. But he made a career out of showing that uh, a job, going to work, correlates uh, very highly with better mental health, uh, whether we're healthy to begin with or not, anywhere on that continuum. Uh, and of course now we've got a workforce shortage, so you kind of put those two things together. So my question, I guess, is how are we operationalizing that uh, wisdom here in Minnesota and beyond? So we do a pretty awful job of it. Um, we have one small program in Minnesota called IPS, Individual Placement and Supports. It's an evidence-based program, but it only works with people with serious mental illnesses. Um, we have had a bill for several years to actually require all the workforce centers to actually look at how do we support someone who comes in who lives with a mental illness. Maybe their resume has holes in it. Um, most people, most employers have no idea at all what an accommodation is for mental illness. I mean, zero, because um, we go in and teach the employers. They don't know. And so, you know, they know if someone's in a wheelchair what to do. They have no idea if someone has schizophrenia or ADHD or anything like that. Um, and so we wanted those workforce centers to actually um, be able to provide that advice, not just send someone off to VR, because most of them aren't going to qualify for that anyway. I will say for that, um, for 21 years, I have tried to get an appointment with the deed commissioner, um, Department of Employment and Economic Development. I finally got one, and the next day he took a job to be editor of the Star Tribune. Um, so I'm going to try again <laughs> with whoever the new commissioner is. Um, but I do think, um, I, I will say that I have seen employers be more interested about mental health in the workplace and you know what that could entail. But I do think our workforce centers really need to understand how to support someone who has a mental illness, um, get a job, and keep a job. Um. I'm blushing a little bit, if you can't tell. And I wish I had known Sue then, because uh, prior to my current role at Rainbow Health, I was the deputy commissioner at DEED, uh, overseeing workforce development. <laughs> Um, during the second Dayton term and oversaw all of the workforce centers all around the state, um, which is a, a, a big system. I mean, there are 90 workforce centers all over the state, and most of those, although overseen by the state, are actually run by local nonprofits in the community. So as someone who tried to do systems change, it took five years to make even small changes, and I'm sorry, I didn't know about uh, you requesting a meeting, but um, hopefully you'll get one soon. And if there's any way, I can help. But I think um, from that experience, so it's interesting you asked that question because I'm being drawn into that world. I think a couple of the things that were important to us while we were there to try to change the system is to change the money. Um, because um, all of those workforce centers and the nonprofit organizations that did the work on the ground followed the money. Um, and so I think a couple of the things that we did was rewrote our state workforce development strategic plan with one singular focus around racial equity. And it was the belief that with all the disparities and all the barriers in our state, so many of them are really linked to the core of racism in our society. And so we felt that we would do the biggest benefit by having a singular focus and then over time revamping and changing the entire system focused on racial equity with the understanding that then you'd be able to address so many other issues along the way. And, um, and then we tied that to funding. So two of our largest um, workforce development funding programs and grants, um, we refocused to prioritizing people with employment disparities. 
Um, so it wasn't just anybody who was unemployed, um, but if you were working with the person who had some of these clear multiple identities, so that if they were formerly incarcerated, if they had a disability, if they were a person of color, um, then they got to the head of the line to get not only a counselor at a workforce center, but money to pay for training, money to go to school, um, money to land them a job at the university or Fairview or um, a company. So I do think that those are some examples of how we can address the workforce shortage um, because it's been with us for a very long time. And so like everything else we've talked about today, the workforce system needs to recognize disparities and barriers and as you know, well-known people have now said, the opposite of racism is not inaction, it's anti-racism. And so we need to do that overcompensate and proactively work to break down those barriers um, to address the workforce shortage and exactly the populations that need it the most. I just want to say, I grew up in Texas. I came here for grad school and now I'm in Tennessee. And I am just impressed with the resources and the incredible work and the hard work that Minnesota is doing to achieve health equity and mental health equity. And for the students in our room, this is unique. You're only, you may only find this kind of model, the Minnesota model of public-private partnership in, in a place in a state like this. Not all states are like this. Maybe on the East Coast, West Coast, and Upper Midwest, um, but whenever, we're, learn, as much as you can here now before you go and do really hard public health work um, in other parts of the country. Some that are under-resourced, including places in Tennessee where remote medical is flying uh, helicopters to, to provide community health fairs that they used to do in some parts of uh, less developed co uh, countries. So learn these best practices here while you can and uh, take them with you throughout your public health careers. Great, thank you. I'd like to follow with a pair of questions that I think are gonna, gonna build a little bit on what you both just said, or what you've all just said. Um, first part of this comes from Zoom, and the question is, uh, we've talked about underserved communities and lack of providers, but we've also seen high rates of burnout among providers. Mm -hmm. This is especially the case among providers from marginalized identities. How do your organization support providers to prevent burnout and facilitate long-term work? Mm -hmm. And then there's another part of this question that I'm putting on with it that came from an index card from someone in the room. And that is, uh, as advocates of mental health, and especially, um, I, I actually I'm gonna broaden it to all of you. As advocates of mental health, how do you stay strong mm -hmm. when the leaders that you're working with, mm -hmm. the politicians you're talking to, perhaps people in the community, don't think about these things the same way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take a chance at that second question. Um, and I think Jeremy uh, slide uh, had mentioned you need to take care of yourself. Um, if you can't take care of yourself, and I think, what is RuPaul's uh, phrase? If you, uh, when you're on the airplane, you have to put your mask on before putting someone else's mask on. And that's, that's the case. You need to take care of yourself. So unplugging um, and, and just escaping uh, the news, the social media, um, and getting away for a week or two, if you can, longer if you can, but you have to unplug, you have to take care of yourself, you have to recharge before jumping back in the game. You have to take care of yourself. And usually, for me, I, I usually, there's a <laughs> yarn, a yarn ball <laughs> that just rolled down just the front here. self-care. <laughs> uh, and so, for me, I, I usually spend two weeks uh, uh, either camping in the boundary waters or um, on a beach somewhere just to unplug and escape from uh, the, the constant news. Um, yeah, I think um, I'll, so many ways to answer that question. And also I think it would be most fair um, and appropriate if one of our employees was answering this question. And so hopefully I can describe it in a way that our staff would agree. Because um, as you can imagine, um, Rainbow Health employs a reflection of the people that we serve. And so we have a lot of LGBTQ folks at Rainbow Health, and a lot of those folks are people of color and trans, non-binary. And so um, part of doing our work is, is self-care. And so one is you have to have that conversation openly and honestly and regularly. You have to always be talking about it. Um, because then it gives people space to say it's okay. To, and as I talked about the client uh, example I gave with housing, we have to take that same approach with our employees. To assume that they've experienced trauma, 
in their life and intergenerational, but that we don't know what that is based on how they look or what we think about them. And so if you take those two things into account for your employees as well as your clients, you will have that conversation. You'll create um, staff training and opportunities and um, conversations to have that work. So we train our staff regularly on trauma-informed care because it's a constant mm -hmm. reminder and revision. Um, we train our staff on harm reduction. And so it not only continues to have us part of that conversation, it recognizes that it's important within it. Obviously, we try to do things as an employer um, in terms of providing um, health insurance, uh, supportive access to health care, including mental health to our employees, making sure we pay them fairly, and all those other things. Um, and I think we do have one advantage, though, um, should you be looking for a future employer that no other place has, is because of who we are, we have a wonderful, unique work environment. And I know I do some of the same things to take care of myself, getting out, I have a therapist, getting in, in nature and self-care, but one of the things that really keeps me going is just coming to work every day mm -hmm. um, and being surrounded by other amazing, wonderful, beautiful people. And when I first came to Rainbow Health and talked to all of our employees, I've been there for four years now, about you know, why they're here and what keeps them here, um, almost every single person said, I feel my whole self here. Um, I belong here. I don't have to leave part of myself at home. And so those are the kind of things that just about any employer would love to hear. And that's the experience that I hear still today. Um, so f that's partly for me, is choosing to be in a work environment like this with other people who choose to be, um, and then taking that as an advantage to make sure you still have those purposeful conversations, because you don't know what you don't know unless you start talking about it. So we're a little different in that we don't do direct treatment. Um, so we provide you know, peer education you know, support. We do a lot of suicide prevention. We have a helpline, things like that. And nearly 100% of my staff either lives with a mental illness or has a family member. Um, we are the queen of accommodations. Um, we have learned you know, definitely how to do that. Um, but there's a couple of other things that we do too. Um, one, our insurance plan has a $500 deductible. So we have committed to making sure that it's not unaffordable and um, it's hard to do a $500 deductible, but we've kind of made that commitment. We also, when we moved our offices, created a quiet room. So if you took a bad call or you taught four suicide prevention classes in a row, you can go in the quiet room. You know, there's a fountain, um, we have weighted blankets, we have sad lights that people can take, you know, adult coloring, um, everything that you can think of is in that little room, um, and you can lock the door and, and people do use it, um, which can be really helpful. Um, and it's the, probably the safest place in the world to say I'm struggling with my mental health. Mm -hmm. Most of our team meetings start off with um, are you green, yellow, or red? So that we can find out kind of how people are doing and then the managers can follow up afterwards, which you think is kind of an important part of it. Um, for myself, um, I am bad at taking vacations. Um, I'm really bad at taking time off. This time of year, I'm doing the seven days a week, you know, 12 hour days because of the legislative session. Um, so I look for those tiny moments, um, honestly, whether it's I'm leaving my office, it's on the fourth floor, I do deep breaths until I get to the first floor. Um, I have a treadmill at home uh, during the winter because I'm not walking outside at my age um, and falling on the ice. So, you know, trying to get on the treadmill in the mornings, which is hard if I have to be somewhere early, but that's kind of my relief. Um, so I, I can't do big things, but I look for those little things mm -hmm. um, that can really help de-stress me um, and, and make me feel connected as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's one other thing. Because, um, because it is hard to create change, right? And that can be really frustrating when you don't get your bills passed or there is you know, a recession or things like that. But I had a wonderful mentor um, early in my career who said, when you look ahead and you see how much you need to do, you need to look behind you and see how far you've come. Mm -hmm. I love that suggestion. Mm -hmm. I had a colleague suggest, in addition to my to-do list, to have an all-done list. Where, the, mm -hmm. where I can just add the things I've accomplished in the week and take a moment to look at that mm -hmm. before just right. moving into the next yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Something I started doing just in the last few months is a success journal. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I am very bad at journaling. I've tried it many times, so many times in my life. I wish I had written things down. Um, so one way that helped me is it's much more focused, but I do a success journal. And so at the end of every day, 
I write down at least five things that went well that day. Mm. And uh, at times when it gets really hard, uh, and you think you haven't made any progress, you can go back in time and think, oh my gosh, that project really did work. I did really improve that relationship with that person. So it's been good for me. It's very specific, very tangible. It takes a couple of minutes, um, but I do keep a success journal. We do little cards, too, at our office. Um, and so there's a bulletin board where people, one says, you are awesome, and one says, Ma you make a difference. And staff give them to each other. Um, and so the whole card, pull, you know, the whole bulletin board fills up by the end of the month. And then at the staff meeting, uh, we pull out one of the cards, and they both get a gift card. Because it's one being recognized for their work, but also that somebody took the time to recognize someone else. And that's been, people have them in their cubicles, um, because it meant a lot that a coworker um, recognized someone Thing that they did. Mm -hmm. Positives. Always helps to reinforce mm -hmm. positives. Thank you. Good. I'd like to pause for a moment and see if folks in the room have questions. Anyone want to come up to the microphone, please? I'm Kayla Peterson. I'm a uh, MPH student here at U of M. I am also the knitter that added some comment <laughs> relief for you all. It is also my mental health relief. Mm -hmm. So um, you've been unraveling some good things for us for today. <laughs> I, I had nice. nice. ones in there. Um, nice. I'm interested in um, knitting up something new. Um, <laughs> How can, Don't new us, <laughs> how can graduate students or other folks that are wanting to get started in this space start creating that new system that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'll, I'll piggyback on my last couple slides, you know, and just remind you about educating yourself and educating others. And so there's a lot of things that we can do when I was your age, we couldn't do in terms of the world of the internet and social media and the access to resources we can. So uh, part of it is always just starting to educate yourself and educate those around you. Um, other more specific things are do you know, internships um, in organizations that are working outside the system. So almost all of the therapists at Rainbow Health started out as interns and worked with us um, and not only is it getting, giving us amazing therapists, but even if they don't stay at Rainbow Health after their internship, they go back to some other clinic with the Rainbow Health model. And so we're just one organization, so I think thinking about internships or volunteer opportunities or even work opportunities, seek out those organizations that are working at a community-based level or models that are outside of the system because then you learn firsthand how those work. You can stay in that organization or take it back and, and change the system. So it's those kind of examples that bring theory to practice in real life, and so work in those organizations. I, I agree completely, and if you can find paid internships, those are probably preferred over volunteer, volunteered internships, so just keep seeking them out. Um, you know what I've seen work among our public health and medical students at Vanderbilt is that health equity really hasn't come from the top down and leadership and, uh, and decisions at the top. It's come from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Our students are craving more health equity, more mental health equity uh, courses, opportunities, funding to go to uh, get training at, at local organizations or at national conferences. So I always, I'm always impressed by how much students um, can can do when they at, when they pull together and ask for what they want what they want or make recommendations for public health uh, curriculum uh, changes for opportunities to really immerse yourself in in public health and mental health. But um, that's worked, and I, I'm really again I'm just impressed by by the students and trainees because a lot of health equity is coming from the bottom up in schools of public health and in medical schools. Um, so just keep, keep asking and keep asking for, for resources, courses when you can, and do it together. I want to echo the importance of the ground up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and people often think about public policy. Someone's done a research paper and then kind of figured this out. It's based on people's stories. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're, um, I mean, I think of many of the bills that I've worked on the last couple of, well, you know, decades, right? It's because someone recognized and identified a barrier and then brought it to mm -hmm. you know using you know our skills to pass bills bringing that issue to us so including you know someone saying yeah i can't find a bipoc supervisor so i'm not going to come license well we can fix that and so it's not just you know when you run into problems and you know you see things not working don't think oh well think 
okay, what is this really, what, what, is, what is really the problem and who can help solve it? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Sue mentioned something in her presentation. It was about calling your representatives and your lawmakers and your policymakers. Don't be afraid to do that. You know, if you're, if, uh, team up uh, with a community organization. I'm sure that there are probably uh, days on the hill for students to go, mm -hmm. and they will schedule all of that, all those meetings for you and train you with policy briefs and what to say and talking points before you meet with lawmakers, because I know it can be scary at first, but you have to engage and, 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 and maintain relationship with your lawmakers, your representatives, and your Senate, because a lot of change, especially in healthcare, happens at the state level. Yep. And you're lucky enough that St. Paul is just a short drive or train right away. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Great, thank you. We have another um, kind of combo question from, that came from a card in the room and then a related question from Zoom. Um, there are a lot of ads seemingly on every podcast for virtual mental health care apps, virtual mental health mm. services um, <laughs> that you can choose and you can work with different, different people through a lot of digital solutions to support mental wellness, things like Headspace, Insight Timer, uh, and virtual organizations like Talkspace, Better Health. Um, so the question is, is there any evidence that the growth and evolution of digital mental health care is increasing access for BIPOC folks, LGBTQ folks, rural folks, people in other communities where there are clear disparities in terms of access to care? I mean, there's some information about telehealth for sure. Mm -hmm. And in rural Minnesota, that mm -hmm. has absolutely made a huge, mm -hmm. huge difference. And telephonic care as well, mm -hmm. especially among people with serious mental illnesses who generally live in poverty and don't even have a smartphone. Um, some of the apps, you know, Headspace, we actually bought the Calm app for all the staff so they could use the meditations, mm -hmm. and that would be kind of the and things. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, um, I worry a little bit, and there's been different studies about, you know, kind of doing this, the weird little health things, you know, on some of these different apps, whether they really work or not, and I think it kind of depends. I think it depends on how serious um, the symptoms are for someone, mm -hmm. whether that's going to be helpful or not. If someone's struggling a little bit, it might certainly be helpful. Um, we've also seen warm lines um, be very helpful for folks who, they're not in a crisis, but they're feeling alone, they're kind of struggling with their mental health. The warm lines have been very effective, um, which we have in Minnesota and many other states as well. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting his name off the top of my head, but he used to be head of NIMH, and he's done a lot of work in this area, um, looking at what works and doesn't work. And I, I think we, I think we want to be just a little bit careful um, about how we proceed in this space to make sure that it's actually good care that you're getting on the mm -hmm. other end of that, that someone's delivering. You don't actually know if they're a mental health professional. You don't know mm -hmm. what kind of training they've had and things like that. So um, I would say be cautious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, so many different things about what's happening in the industry today, and I think um, there are lots of positives and, and, and concerns, as Sue said, but I think that um, it is very exciting to think about that that trans person of color in rural Minnesota can now get access to some kind of mental health care that they couldn't get before. Um, it's certainly in my experience at Rainbow Health, as soon as uh, the pandemic hit and we switched, to virtual health, we started advertising our services around the state, and we had um, a lot of people from mm -hmm. greater Minnesota get connected to our care who would not have been able to get connected otherwise. And there are lots of these companies right now, and I think given all the barriers we've talked about to mental health care, the fact that there are more access points is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It is a little bit of a wild west. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so it, it does, um, um, it is challenging to figure out what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And um, one of, that's another thing that we do at Rainbow Health is have um, resource guides and directories. Um, as We train providers, we train organizations. So we can give some insight about Minnesota-based organizations, about have they been trained by us, um, are they in our directory or not. Um, but it's a really rapidly changing space, and so I think we have to be on top of it. Um, and uh, have, have clear standards. But I think it's, it's ultimately a good thing. But I also want to just note um, that part of that, the pointed part of the question is, is there research? And there's really not. Um, but from my perspective, that should not be surprising. And if there's anything that you all can do, um, if you're interested in research, 
um, is there is a dearth of research. There's no research, very little, about in BIPOC communities, in LGBTQ mm -hmm. communities. And so many of my conversations with government entities, the, f the first thing that they want to help our community is, what data are you collecting? Um, how are you collecting it? What are you doing with it? What are you reporting out? So whether it's a, a company or a government agency, and it's, it's challenging. So if you remember uh, a couple of years ago when the state was doing uh, COVID vaccinations and they were asking questions about sexual orientation and gender identity, which we were excited about that the governor and the health commissioner had included that and defended it, it became an issue and a debate at the state legislature. And legislators challenged that and said, you shouldn't be making Minnesotans ask, answer questions about sexual orientation and gender identity when they're just trying to get a vaccine. And the state defended that. The governor and the health commissioner defended it. Um, so it's not easy, but I think there is not enough research and we're not collecting enough data. Um, and so all of you in the public health world who are interested in that can be starting to do research projects, mm -hmm. um, collecting the data that needs to be collected about populations that don't get asked enough about, um, and then making sure that that data is used and reported out. So then we can all make decisions, um, but there's not nearly enough research to begin with. Great, thank you. I think we have time, just a couple more minutes for one final question. And this is a composite of a number of different questions coming in, both from the room and from our Zoom uh, callers. Um, and this question is kind of the big picture of, of how to prioritize how to act. What are the best places to intervene? If you could add one program, one service to meet the needs of people with mental illness, what would you pick? What's the top legislative issue at the local level? What is the first thing that you can do this afternoon, tomorrow, next week for everyone in this room to, to jump in? Well, I, actually, I'm going to push back and say that you can't pick one thing. I mean, that's why we have 18 bills, to try to really address the entire mental health system. Because, you know, I mean, it's, um, it, and it depends on the, on the person, right? If they don't have housing, well, I would focus on housing first, um, because you can't work on your recovery if you don't have a home, right? Um, it, we have to do all of these things. Um, and, I, you know, whatever, whatever the issue is, whether it's, you know, a, addressing racism, you know, disparities, equity, it, there's never one thing that you can do. And if, if there was, and you had that magic wand, right, we would have done it. Um, the problem is that it's, it's multiple things that you have to do in order to really change a system. Mm -hmm. So sorry, I'm not gonna answer that question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's quite a big question, I, I agree. If, if this work was easy, we would have done it already. It's mm -hmm. hard work. Um, and there's so many different levels to it. Um, I think if there's one just final thought that I can leave with you, um, is it does you know, start to take care of yourself. But when I talked about um, educating yourself and thinking about, and all of us are an ally at some point, right? Um, and so what I try to do, and I recommend all of you to do, is when you go to the dentist, when you go to a doctor, when you go to your therapist, when you interact with healthcare in any way, think about what that experience would be like for someone different than you. Look around. Would a, would a trans black woman be comfortable here? Mm -hmm. Would someone with a disability be safe here? Um, and, and when you just take a moment and pick one of those and think about the experience for that person, and then you think, well, this person who's just doing a blood draw for a lab test right now is asking me invasive questions about my family. It's easy for me to answer. How would that be? for someone else. And so I think if there's anything you can do to try to put yourself in someone else's shoes is in those healthcare experiences, think about what would this be like for someone different than me? Mm -hmm. And then maybe make that suggestion to that office um, and try to create change in those, in those small ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with the, the panelists here. Um, and I, I think that the Biden administration is trying to increase the number of mental health providers, either through um, the Inflation Reduction Act or, or, or COVID, and, uh, COVID policies. But you know, I think we also need to make it more affordable uh, to access mental health care. Not every, most, 
mental health providers are not going to accept insurance. It's too difficult for them, usually when they're on their own, to bill an insurance company. So they'd rather be paid out of pocket, and not everybody can afford that $80 to $120 for a 45-minute session. So we need to figure out how to make it more affordable. You know, when uh, the vaccines came out, they were free. How do we get closer to something that is more accessible and affordable than, than not. And I, I think for me, the affordability issue is something that, that is just seriously missing from the debate altogether. Great. Thank you so much. I really want to thank our panelists. They've given us so much to think about, so much to work with, wonderful insights and ideas for action and big picture things to consider. And just please join me in thanking them for being here today and sharing their wisdom with us. As we're closing, I would like to thank our co-sponsors who are listed here, thank the Health Equity Work Group Planning Committee, and I'd like to thank you all for being part of this today. This is, it's wonderful to see so many people here. I know so many more people are on Zoom. Um, thank you for doing this work and for making the time to be here and for going out and going forward, carrying all this, this good information and these good suggestions and the energy from this conversation, bringing it out into the work that you do. So thank you all for participating. Um, Want to let people know that an evaluation form will be sent out in the following days, uh, and it'll go to the email that you use to register for this event. So please do fill out that evaluation. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah.